all for joining us this evening. We're do it three times. We did start at six o'clock um, and had some closed session on personnel and um, items of that nature. We are back in open session. Um, first, I would need approval of the minutes as they are in your packets. Move approval of the minutes as submitted. Second. Uh, any discussion on those minutes? And we have minutes from our regular board meeting, a special board meeting with our Justice League, as well as our curriculum special meeting. If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, I need approval of tonight's agenda with no additions. Right? No additions. No additions. Approve the agenda as submitted. Second. Jack and Peggy, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <coughs> so we have our administrative reports, beginning with our student reports. Anaya and Alyssa. Hi, I think Alyssa's starting tonight. Yeah. First, I would like to personally thank Mr. Gutenberg for the snow day on Friday. It was <laughs> greatly appreciated. <laughs> and very needed. So, thank you. I was thinking of you. There you go. Yeah. Just for you, Alyssa. Yeah. Okay, to start off, we have four new clubs starting this year. The first one is Aviation Club. So this was started by two students, Ryan Badger and Mason McGuire, and they, or the advisor is Mr. France. And so this club is for students who are interested in any aspect of aviation, whether that's being a private pilot, commercial pilot, drone, or um, RC aircraft. Not exactly sure what that is, but that's what they told me. Um, Radio control, I think. Cool. Um, so Aviation's Club has had two guest speakers so far and a trip to the Dane County Airport where the members were given a tour and were invited back to watch the operations of snow removal. Um, they had two guest speakers, Bill Horn, who is a retired American Airlines captain, and he spoke about training aviation schools and gave some recommendations for those interested in pursuing any aviation-related career. The second guest speaker was Mike Loringer. He is a former Navy pilot and current F-16 pilot and he spoke about his path to becoming a fighter pilot and the past weekend the members traveled to the ski plane fly-in at the Pioneer Airport in Oshkosh. So another new club that was started this year was the Computer Science Club. It was started by sophomore Sammy Jirasi and senior Sam Bennett. They both were taking computer science and became very interested in the idea. So they are both co-founders and co-presidents, and Nathan Breinig is the vice president. Mr. Bavau was chosen as the advisor, and then the club was approved. The club has only had a few meetings so far this year, but they have had practice, program practice programming challenges for people to practice in competitions that are coming up. The first competition was on the 8th of February, and that consisted of different programming challenges designed by the leaders of the club. The club plans to participate in competitions at the local and national level, and even some competitions put on by Google and other national and international organizations. Along with this club, uh, Junior Grace Walnitz is starting a coding club at the middle school. So to kind of branch off of that, she's doing Mondays after school, having middle schoolers come in and practice coding, which is kind of in the realm of computer science as well. Another new club is Law Club, who was started by Mr. Barfnicht and Kaylee Buckwalter. And Mr. Barfnicht wanted to start this because he's very into social studies and wanted to have this type of club at, the, at his high school. And this club goes along with Mock Trial Club. And it was Kaylee's suggestion, who, and she is now an officer. And so they wanted to make a club that was a close-knit group of students to discover career options in the legal field and to have like a humorous environment while exploring their options. So, so far the club has had a variety of semi seminars throughout the year, ranging from exploring citizens' rights with the police, recent developments in the law, discussions on college options, and general social get-togethers. 
another new club that was started this started this year i'm sorry i can't talk today was the badminton club it was started by four high school students and they started it because they really enjoyed playing it in gym class so kudos to freshman gym and lifetime the club is very laid back for students who just want to come and have fun but they do make their own tournaments to start kind of challenging each other and for students who want to play badminton competitively the overall goal is to make fun to make friends while having fun playing badminton and now for Student Council. Student Council is hosting Winter Formal this weekend on Saturday 17th. In the past, the Student Council has hired a professional DJ, but this year we're going to have a student do it, and that student is Grace Gengler. And last month was JDRF, which was Juvenile Diabetes. Um, and so overall, we raised $3,000 from fundraising at a variety of sporting events with um, baskets and like Miracle Minutes. And last blood drive of the year took place a week ago. A week and a half ago. And uh, we had a total of 61 units of blood donated, which means 186 lives were saved. Wow. Yeah. Really good turnout this year. Mm -hmm. So that's I it. think that's it. Very impressive, ladies. Oh, very impressive. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. ladies. <coughs> um, next, we have our teacher report. Uh, but Cindy, you know we're mad at you. Because <laughs> oh, my name brought up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, we still love you. Thank you. <laughs> we also want to thank you, Mr. Gutenberg, for Friday's snow day. <laughs> 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 no. I just can't compete with that. I've got a copy of it. I can't compete. Um, so we have um, other talkers today. I'm going to start out. Um, this week, if you don't know, is um, Love Your Public Schools Week. So. Um, that's something we're focusing on as teachers is getting the word out there about how we support public schools and that public schools are for all students and we don't turn kids down and that whole thing. So I have st a very teachery thing for you. I have stickers for you. Um, <laughs> we're encouraging people to wear them on Wednesday on Valentine's Day because we love our public schools. So, um, so I will pass those around for you. Um, we are very much um, getting this out in our social media. We just want to put that positive um, face on public schools because we know how good they are for kids. So. So speaking of love for public education, um, we just wanted to let you know that for the second year, the WTA is offering a $300 scholarship for any Wanakee students interested in pursuing public education. Um, so we will also be putting that on our social media. And if anyone knows of anyone who's interested, um, information is available at the high school. And then the WEAC Professional Issues Conference is coming up on March 2nd through 4th at the Madison Concourse. Um, the sessions uh, support our goals this year of Joy of Teaching and Social Justice, which are two of our focuses. Um, some of the sessions are about combating racism in a primarily white school district. Another one's about teaching human rights. The keynote speaker will be talking about countering Islamophobia, so we're really excited with the sessions that they're offering this year. There'll be two Wisconsin Teachers of the Year presenting, and we have about seven to ten teachers that are going to be attending. Thanks, Thank ladies. Um, and next we have board reports. Um, first of all, uh, any board reports other than the state convention report? Anybody? Else? I have a quick one. I got to attend the chamber breakfast with Randy oh, last week. Thank you for doing that. And it was an excellent update from a whole bunch of areas throughout our community, but I do have to say, Randy's update was definitely the most fun and the most impressive. And the reason I say that is because Randy told our story through telling the story of students. And he had small examples of uh, different successes that we're, that we're having with our students. And he made it very personal. And um, you all should have heard it. We're doing a lot of great things. And I, I really appreciate Randy's approach and how he gives those updates. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, anybody? else attend anything? If not, we'll move on to the state convention reports. Um, great attendance this year. We had five board members um, and all of our lovely administrators and Steve stayed and that's awesome. So anybody want to start with the reports? Well, I can start. I also have uh, pointed some uh, I think I follow Julie's uh, example in that. Uh, I'm sorry. Is, 
if anybody wants additional information, there's quite a few sessions I attended, and I've got copies of notes and presentations if somebody wants to follow up. My focus was on um, community engagement, kind of getting a legislative update from John Forster and uh, the USAA, and then um, primarily um, HR kinds of issues as well, with it, whether it's respective to uh, strategic compensation for teachers and administration, teachers compensation, employee retention, and, and planning in general. Um, and I'm not going to read the notes, you can see the highlights, um, but I did want to note that um, particularly one presentation, 20 Proven Tactics to Increase Community Engagement. I have a great handout on that, but the good news is we do all, we are doing a lot of what they are doing. Um, and it might be, for us, I would say it might be worthwhile inventorying what we are currently doing, just kind of using a framework and say, well, we're doing that. And it would make it easier than starting from scratch because what we're doing is very noteworthy and there are a few other ideas we might want to consider to improve on what we're doing. So that was, not, that's, that was from Elm Grove, or Elm Brook Schools, which is Brookfield and uh, Elm Grove a large district with, you know, one of the present presenters was the chief strategy officers. So they've got a whole different administrative, you know, structure as well. But I think, you know, the one thing that I find when going to these conferences is that we are doing a lot of wonderful things. We've got to get reinforced a lot um, by the things we're doing. You always pick up something new. And um, um, that's the benefit of going to these conferences. Um, on some of the HR pieces, I think, you know, the things that we are doing in the use of um, committees that incorporate all the staff in these planning things and having a model before moving forward with something is, is the message uh, that it was strong. Uh, those districts that have put things in place are still trying to figure it out and some are not sustainable, even admitting it. Um, and um, there were some great um, keynotes presentations as well, um, as well as just conversations that I have notes on. And, there is the, the conference itself is a wonderful opportunity to network, learn, and, um, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to attend. We also had, and I, I didn't take very good pictures, but there were four of our students that had art pieces uh, in the um, student art project. So, I mean, I, mean, I took copies of them. I can pass them around. Uh, they're not great pictures, but it gives you an idea. I was really, really, really impressed with the quality of the artwork. And basically, for those who don't know what this is, um, students are, are provided kind of a theme and what they do is create a piece of art um, and then have to write a caption underneath it explaining what this is communicating. And uh, the four students that we had representing were represented were, were phenomenal and so it was really neat. This is the first time in all the years I've attended the conferences we've had some artwork from Saponiki students so I'm very appreciative of, of the instructors who kind of made them aware of it. And, um, so. A couple of follow-ups in the art. I spoke to our art teachers about that when I returned the pieces to the art room. And they said part of our challenges with with getting students artwork there is the time frame of when they identify the theme ah. to when you have the, and then the process as far. So the way that those art pieces were displayed there, there was specific direction. There's a lot of work that goes into actually getting the piece ready to be submitted for consideration. Yeah, so that's part of, so, but they are working on some options to see if they can get started earlier or have students who can maybe have pieces from this year relay into next year. Because trying to have it done from September until when those are sent in in mid-fall, that it's kind of difficult. So now, is that something that the school board association doesn't do a timely enough fashion communicated to the schools? Or, or maybe just because those that have done it in the past know how, the, how it works so now the timeline. Right. I think it's that. I think people who've done it in the past know the timeline and I think that was the piece that our staff learned was that if there's a way that they could engage some of our, our juniors who are going to be here as seniors that they could move some of those pieces forward that they started. Okay, what is, and one other thing is that there's usually um, a, a scholarship, a large scholarship provided to a, a person who submits a piece of artwork and it's chosen to be the, the best of show for a work of a better word, and it's, uh, it's really kind of a neat thing. So I was thrilled to see some of our students work there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I got to be a representative for all the resolutions, which was extremely not exciting. Um, all, all the resolutions that were recommended by the WASB board passed. Um, the one that we were kind of concerned with that would have gotten rid of the hours requirement 
was actually not recommended by the review committee, so it did not get reintroduced, so that never showed up. Um, there was one put in by Wauwatosa that had to be accepted on the floor um, that, well, it's difficult to explain until you know what a negative tertiary district is, which I had the privilege of finding out through a five-hour discussion on school finance, um, which happened in a separate meeting. That was very exciting. If you haven't been to a five-hour discussion of school finance, you haven't spent enough time with spreadsheets. Um, don't ever do it. So the proposed resolution, though, does affect us, um, which was to support legislation that would allow you to exempt um, any future referendums for debt service costs for maintenance or buildings. So if you do a referendum in the future and you have debt service on your building from a referendum, that would not count against your school aid calculation. So we would be helped by that because we are, unfortunately, a negative tertiary district. Or is that fortunately, Steve? Unfortunately. unfortunately. Well, it's, it's unfortunate you lose money, but it's fortunate that you're in effect at that high of a level. Um, so it's a weird thing. But it would basically allow maintenance and construction to not count, referendums to not count against your school aid formula, which right now it does. So when we pass a referendum, you may say it's $100 million, but because of this aid you lose, it could be a $115 million cost, <coughs> even though you approved a $100 million referendum because you lost so much school aid. Um, I think that's the rough explanation, Steve. Mm -hmm. So by passing that one, they're going to try to work on getting that into school aid that those referendums don't come against you in the future, which I think is even more important for a lot of other school districts around the state, especially the rural ones who are having heavy maintenance costs and having to do referendums for maintenance, but it's like, great, it cost me $100 to replace the carpet, and I've got to pay $110 for it. So hopefully, maybe something will be done on that for the rural districts, which would also help us. Um, the other thing I did, besides learning about school funding, the other thing I did talk with was um, one of the vendors there was H&H &H Solar. And they are working on a similar program that's been used in Madison, which is called Third Party Solar, where basically a company comes in, funds your solar project, because as a private company, they can get all the federal tax credits, which we as a public entity can't. They pay and put the solar on top of your building. They collect the money back from the solar. You get paid lease agreement for having it on top of your building. And in the long run, you own it. And after a certain number of years, you start getting the money back from the inner, from your service provider, which would be Wanakee Electric here. So I, I hope the facility committee and stuff will start looking into that because I think we have a, we did set up for a lot of space on the IS building for solar that we couldn't do initially because of the upfront cost. This might be a way to get past it, plus still allow the training, and we can start getting some more money that we could put towards maintenance of the building and things like that. Uh, well, I guess what I'd like to share first of all is that um, the theme of the convention this year was telling a story <coughs> which particularly resonated I think for us as a district because we've been working on ways as part of our strategic plan to better communicate and engage with the community and make that two-way communication. Um, one of the breakouts I did was an in-depth breakout that Randy attended with me, which had some ideas about um, different things that uh, other districts are doing. I think we're kind of behind the curve in terms of having a communication director or someone actually in charge to help us better coordinate our communications efforts. So I know we'll be continuing to look at some of those ways um, as part of our strategic plan. <coughs> Hopefully we can use some of those ideas. Um, Again, I really liked the keynote speakers, and I thought that the personal stories that they shared um, really bring us back to the parts that are important. And to the extent that we can better connect education with the parts that are human and personal, um, you, can, you can teach facts, you can teach skills, but the part that makes it real and can't be replaced in terms of the job market is the human connection pieces. So anything we can do to encourage 
um, the arts or liberal arts education um, develops the whole person um, and that really um, gives <coughs> the foundation that um, best launches them regardless of what their career path is going to be. So um, I really enjoyed that part and again one of the highlights of the convention always with me is making those connections with um, the fellow board members. Mm -hmm. I think the better we get to know each other and understand each other's personal stories, the better we work together as a group and appreciate those individual lenses that give us stronger group decisions. So once again, my pleasure to go. Thanks for the arts. Yeah. Um, I don't really have a lot more to add. I did a lot of um, sessions on how to attract and retain staff. I learned a lot about the millennial generation, um, what's important to them. Um, that was a great education for me because that is definitely a different generation and a different mindset than um, I think I approach problems and problem solving with. But I think I agree with Julie, and the biggest takeaway from that week for me is having that time with fellow board members, having that time to connect with board members. You know, as you go year after year, you see the ones from Monona Grove and the folks from Sun Prairie and what's happening in those other districts, and just just such a great time to share and connect and you just come away with an appreciation of your own district. Um, it kind of helps center you and keeps, you know, your problems, I think, become smaller once you kind of get out there and look at everybody else. So I just appreciate the opportunity and really want to thank the board members for taking the time to come. Any other comments for anybody? Um, next up we have, um, I don't know if we need to say much about the timeline for the boards um, and superintendent evaluations. Hopefully everybody's done their self-evaluation. If not, that would be appreciated. <laughs> and the superintendent evaluations and the update that we were provided earlier, um, hopefully that will be done for next for March. And, and what I'd suggest is uh, what Rebecca has put together is for the approved new superintendent evaluation tool that we went, developed last year, as well as the evaluation of the priorities, which you use this that we discussed earlier for reference. If you go into board book, the quick view version, you will see some fill in PDF documents. Uh, I've tried them. Uh, the, what you need to do is click on them. Download them and save them to your computer first before starting to fill them out. Otherwise, you might fill something out and it won't be saved. So, um, you know, once you download it into your computer and save it as your own, um, then basically you can go through and you'll see if they'll put in the rating and comments, rating comments, and it's all just, I think, well done. Thank you, Rebecca, for putting that together. Um, and. Um, you are able to go back and make changes and update it as much as you want, and then you can just send it back electronically. But don't try to fill it out without doing the download save first, because otherwise it, um, everything you do will go away. So. Thank you. Does it turn it into a Google Doc? Is that what it does? No. No, I don't. I don't know. It basically it saves it. Okay. Your computer. It just saves it. And if you save it, save it like Wayner evaluation. Okay, got it. Yeah. Oh, so when you get them, then it just comes. Yep. You know who's who. Okay. Yep. <coughs> so, if that could be completed by our March meeting, that would be appreciated. Um, next on the agenda is our sculpture update. We have many people from that committee here, and it's a committee that I've been able to attend, not very frequently, but a few times, and appreciate all their time and effort. And we have Nick and a previous student, Stephanie, and a previous teacher. Oh, man, we got all everybody here. Hey. That's right. The big guns are here, right? Hello. <laughs> I'm Nick Mishler, along with Kevin Laffey, uh, co-chair of the Sculpture Project and the Wanaki Area Public Arts Committee. And next slide, please. <laughs> we are a small but mighty band. 
and uh, ask the members of our committee who are here tonight to raise their hand, including the superintendent. And some of our members are sick and out of town. But we've expanded our committee from the last time in that we have a number of artists on, uh, those, some who are school teachers and others who are in the community. Next. So Kathy and I will quickly take you through uh, our history in progress, introduce you to Michael Kalish and also to his design, uh, the renderings of his design. So this all started, you've heard some of this before, and when Kevin and I were having conversations back a couple of years ago about we're blessed with such uh, an extraordinary school system consistently in the top tier, my wife and I moved our family here 40 years ago this year because of the school system and many others before and after. And how do we acknowledge and celebrate uh, this wonderful school system that we have? And we were sort of stuck for an answer. And so we talked to many of you and talked to community leaders and uh, took some time but came to let's commission a major artwork, a sculpture, to celebrate excellence in education and honor all teachers and staff within the Wanakee Community School System. Uh, we also did some uh, exploratory work, other communities, what they've done with sculptures in their communities. Uh, we spent some time on the site, and we came to you a year ago, and you approved the site, the uh, plaza entrance, southwest entrance to the high school. And along the way, we learned, well, this really would be significant and favorable to the Wanakee area creative economy. So our goal is 100,000, uh, Coda Works and some professors at the university said, you know, if you want really attract quality uh, and get some real attention from some good uh, artists, sculptor artists, you need a budget of 75 to 100,000. We have 75 definitely allocated to the Mr. Kalish and his team. That is fixed. So we have some variable costs beyond that, which is really the site uh, uh, work and we've had some other um, uh, with Coda Works, Honoraria, Travel, and so on. Since this slide is put together, we are now over 77,000 uh, raised and pledged. But take attention to the in-kind donations. That exceeds $20,000, and much of that, or most of that, is really from our committee and also a school board member, which is the landscaping and infrastructure work, <coughs> uh, whether we need gravel, uh, big equipment, and so on. So the higher that goes, the less we need to raise. And that 100000 includes a maintenance fund and uh, gives us some wiggle room if there's some extraordinary costs that come along for the site. And I do want to thank WAIF and Wanakee Community Foundation, both our fiscal agents for us and have contributed uh, through grants to us. And so we hired Coda Works and our friend here, uh, Stephanie O'Keefe, works for Coda Works and she also, because she's a graduate of Wanakee High School, is spending a lot of time and has joined our committee and very much appreciate that. So we have exposure to thousands of artists. We had 41 artists applied to the request for qualification. We made effort to get Wisconsin artists, so eight were from Wisconsin. And uh, at this time, three of you Joan, Peggy, and Julie joined our group so that we had school board representation. And uh, three of the, vi of the artists visited us. They met with students. They interviewed. They had tour of the schools. They uh, had tours of the community. And of course, this was over Oktoberfest, so they experienced Wanakee's Gamitlakaik, and it was all uh, very good. And uh, yes, the libations flowed, OK? <laughs> And so, we, this is the site, as you know, and this is going to be a truly multidisciplinary uh, opportunity. Uh, the heads of the art department, the music department, athletics, technology, the innovation center want their students to participate. And because of who we have, uh, the marketing folks are going to learn a lot. And with uh, um, having a, a teacher involved in the landscaping, former teacher, you know, the horticulture. So this is going to be a phenomenal opportunity for students and working with the world-class artists like this could be really life transforming. So who is Michael Kalish? Michael Kalish grew up in uh, New England. He was a star athlete. He was heading towards a major league baseball career when he had an injury in college, which really threw uh, you know, a monkey wrench into that into the gears, and so he searched and found himself in the world of art. And in 20 years, he has become 
uh, internationally known. He's compared to an Andy Warhol, uh, Roy uh, Lichtenstein, and uh, is really well known. Go on. And a couple of things that distinguish him. One is color, another is Americana, another is recycling. Um, here he worked with uh, Danica Patrick, the race car driver, uh, on COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is a traveling uh, exhibition that went to 24 states. Those are license plates. He likes the rust, the color, the patina, and, and uh, again, is very creative. Next. And another, some other things distinguish besides uh, the color is there's an excitement and you have to, it's a discovery, you have to learn. Here they call this the art of finding love because there's only one vantage point where you can really see that this is the word love uh, that, that is there. Next, and one is most famous is realize, or if I can pronounce it, realize. Uh, Muhammad Ali, he and his family commissioned this work. And again, from one vantage point, you will see what is there. You can see the, the slices that he has there in the layers. And this is 1,300 punching bags that he has assembled and, and put to show Muhammad Ali. Next. And so uh, some pop art that he does. And again, the layering. He'll, here's uh, our friend Elvis next. Uh, because he was an athlete, a lot of his work uh, is uh, both for athletes, but also that theme. Next. Uh, again, color, uh, a lot of portraits, uh, love, peace, uh, harmony uh, comes through also in his work. Uh, our friend Ringo Starr is a collector of his, and you see the next slide, a number of people from the Reagans to Floyd Merriweather to Lady Gaga, and uh, maybe some folks in this room, who knows? <laughs> So in 20 years, many exhibitions uh, across the U.S. and into uh, the U.K., Sweden, Switzerland, next. And a lot of press. And we believe Wanaki will get a lot of press. And just recently, in uh, December on the right, he was a featured artist, uh, Nexus Globe 2017, along with Art Basel 2017 in Miami. 15,000 galleries and artists are there, and he's featured. And on the left, uh, the, the National Football League commissioned uh, a one-of-a-kind sculpture for the Giving Back Fund Humanitarian Award, which was awarded last week in, in uh, the Twin Cities. And so this is Michael Kalish. And why did we, our group, unanimously select Michael Kalish? Well, he stood out uh, compared to all of the uh, other uh, applicants and finalists he did the best responding to our request for qualification, incorporating uh, the words and the ideas of what uh, Wanaki is. He did the best interacting uh, with students when he was here. His students attend public schools in LA, and he also teaches uh, when he can in the uh, LA uh, school system. He did the best incorporating the creative ideas from um, Kayla Proctor's advanced art workshop, and really did the best with the interview. And finally, his uh, proposal was superior and had his shoulders above uh, everyone else's. Kathy? So here it is. And this is the first draft, the first rendition that he showed us. And I just need to say how exciting it was to see it, how exciting it is to describe it. But I'm going to use his words to describe what you have to see here. So I quote, Imagine a sculpture that illuminates Wanaki's past spiraling upward to a bright future. A sculptural staircase of steel books ascending to the sky so that the students, educators, and the town may reach for the stars yet keep their feet planted firmly in their history. The piece that I have designed encapsulates this vision. Start talking about education, the very foundation of a child's bright future begins at school. Wanaki High School's spiraling staircase of steel books will be a functional sculpture during the day and light up the entrance to the school at night, just as the school lights a path to the student's educational journey. The sight of a student literally climbing these stairs or sitting on this visualize the concept of students metaphorically growing out of the books and the knowledge that they receive. It moves me to envision this sculpture as a destination and a meeting place. The steel sculpture will last for years to come, bearing witness to many growing friendships and relationships. And so when we looked at this, we looked at uh, 
details of this in the next slide. And on the edge of each one of those books on the spines will be different words. And they will be uh, steel cut images and titles of books that will be reflective of Wanaki. We might have a light bulb, uh, hand growing seeds, railroad, words like innovation, dream, grow, imagine. And as you notice, the sides of these books, are some of them are empty because not all of those words have been decided on yet. That's going to be part of the process of talking to the students and the community and the teachers and putting words that belong to Wanaki there. So this is a short, um, a small detail of it so that you can see that it will, it will also have a perspective whereby you can walk around this and see all the details in a different from a different angle, different perspective, and a thoughtful way of enjoying the entire artwork. There's also a perspective of color. You notice that this side has different words. This might be a different section. Um, it also has different colors. Um, the colors will vary in shade and brightness, and we look to seeing it being very colorful, but the color scheme has not been decided yet, and we're gonna continue to work on what colors would fit our vision of this final project. The next slide has some uh, hands planting some seeds. And the next one is a rendering where we asked uh, Michael to consider adding an open book on one edge or several edges of the sculpture um, alongside the stacked bindings to make the piece more dynamic and to allow us to have other laser cut words or images that would reflect our pride of education here in Wanakee. Also from above, we asked him to um, from the first rendition that you saw, we asked him to put more pathways into it. So if you're looking down on it, um, th you could walk around it more readily and there would be um, no obstruction for traffic. People can come and go from Community Drive, from the high school, from the stadium, and it would bring it into a more conversational kind of place. Um, Michael enjoyed his trip to Wanakee and he left us this quote, but one of the reasons that the committee really liked him so much was his eagerness to work with the school and the community and area businesses. And many of these people and business have already pledged in-kind support to help fabricate parts of it, uh, lay foundation. But the one thing that he kept saying in our interviews and in our discussions was he was the, mo the most impressed by our school motto. And that's where he started his thinking. He said he loved the words of, committed to children, committed to community, committed to excellence. And we really feel like he took the essence of what we have here and put it into this sculpture. So we encourage you to follow along with Michael Kalish at his, on his Facebook website and Instagram. And we um, would encourage you to ask other questions if you have them, Nick is here to answer some questions. And our next steps here are going to be, of course, finish the fundraising look for approval of contracts and we're looking forward to seeing Michael at the end of March and start the whole collaboration from so we can move from this rendition to a more precise picture of what it's all going to look like. So I just want to conclude with I'm really excited. We are very excited and I'd like to em emphasize how exciting it is to see something um, honoring education right in our front doorstep. This community has stood for excellence in education for as long as I can remember, and f probably before that. And to have us make a visual statement about who we are and what we stand for in this district and what you have all worked for and what the community has all worked for and putting it as a visual statement for the rest of the world, I think is inspiring and, uh, and a wonderful thing. So thank you for listening. So we're going to put a blitz on, and thanks to you, Jack, going to help us get there, yeah, I understand. <laughs> and um, to... <laughs> That's right, I'll be on the corner with my monkey and my accordion, and, and you can be on the other corner. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to be doing. But um, our goal is to finish the fundraising next month or two. Michael's coming here at the end of the month, uh, probably around March 29. In fact, we're going to uh, tentatively have him on for a rotary meeting on that Thursday and uh, certainly be our guests uh, to come, those of you who are not voter members and those who are, come. Uh, he'll come with his architect, and then usually it's, uh, Steph can practice here six to nine months, 
Yeah, usually um, the fabrication in installation takes a number of months. Our original goal was to do it in the summertime, obviously, when school was not in session, but um, it might be later than that, so we might have to work on you know weather, making sure that it's not in weather like we have right now. Um, but I mean, definitely within the next year. I mean, this isn't uh, years out; this is months out. The main thing is to do it right, and that's somewhat why we've been slower than perhaps you like. But we see this as the first and an iconic work uh, for our community and uh, bring others. Yes. So is this made in your uh, studio and then brought? No, that was a differentiator. The others <coughs> was their studio, excuse me, to bring it. <coughs> Mike intends to work with uh, local fabricators. Uh, he had a tour and met uh, over at Enders with Sam and Ken. We'll introduce him over at Madrax also. This is going to be powder coated steel. And um, so that, that's the idea. And they get a gr another great opportunity for students. Uh, that's his intent. <clears throat> this price is fixed, 75000 for him. Uh, he sought us out. He believes in what we're doing here. He identifies with, he's interested. And he's doing this at cost or loss because, and, and so to me, that's just phenomenal. It really impressed me. He also really believes in the mission of public education. Yes, too. For yeah. a man with his kinds of resources mm -hmm. to make the choice for his own children to put them into public schools, I think just speaks volumes. So that was another reason he was attracted to the project. He really believes in the important mission of public education. It was a thrill for the few of us that had an opportunity to meet, to meet him live and to hear him speaking in those terms and what drew him to this particular project. He's, he's passionate about it and obviously he's um, does great work. When you hear the end of March, he'll meet with students. <coughs> Whenever he comes to meet with students, uh, we'll plan regular video conferencing uh, also. So, and again, he's a natural communicator with yes. students. You could just see that. He did better than uh, some of the teachers who are sculptor artists also. I mean, uh, he has that innate talent. I gotta say, I really like the design. I like the idea of the books and the, the etching on the sides and stuff. And it, it brings me to some of the other stuff I've seen at other public buildings. Is there, and I'm not sure if there's a way to do it, but when you look at all the different words and stuff you can do on all these different edges of these books, mm -hmm. is there any way to allow future classes to pick one. In other words, leave a, a bunch of them empty, and then that way each next class, each next grade, can look at saying they're going to create one book. Or well, not, you know, add a book onto it, but actually mm -hmm, do the mm -hmm. etching on the side. Now, considering the type of etching you have to do, that may not be possible. Well, but I, I, it's just I, a I, way I, to try to keep it going and growing and changing. Sure. I think it's a great idea, and that's the kind of thing we, we'll bring to him when, when, when he is here. I, I think we commented, there's going to be internal LED lighting, so the light's going to come out and through, so at night, a very different uh, perspective than during the day. I mean, I don't want to speak for him, <coughs> but he's definitely the type of artist and person that works with us and what suggestions we have and I know that they use a laser uh, like a water jet laser cut approach but it seems to me that there's definitely room to grow and change um, with time and I think that's definitely something we can bring up to him. My gut tells me that's something he would be really interested mm -hmm. in yeah. given. About, the yeah about the fact that it changes <laughs> yes. a little bit every year. Because he's so into the interaction it's not the and the same thing. <laughs> Interesting. And he was very student oriented. He yeah. wanted it to be yes. a gathering place. He wanted people to interact with the art. He said, "We don't. W I don't want to put something there that somebody's going to walk by and go, oh, there it is." Um, <laughs> he, I, he said, "I want the students to feel it and touch it and be inspired by it and have conversations." And so that would be part of the artwork, the actual interaction of students as they come and go, and other community members as well. So. That he was one of the major considerations when we were choosing him was his dedication to education and the fact that students were the center of what he was thinking, which is what I think this district has done and it continues to do. We're, we're, we are very student oriented. Do you have an estimation on how high it is? 
Yes, uh, you see, this is the original, and in our conversations um, amongst us, we uh, went back to him and said, we want this lowered uh, no more than four feet, and so this would perhaps be the four feet. Uh, <coughs> and again, these will not just be, they'll be, go ahead. <laughs> that's four feet. And there's code also uh, issues when you get o over that. And we also want it broken up so the pathways are open, so he comes from a parking, uh, the high school, the community drive, the stadium, uh, it's not impeded. One of the things we did, Jack, was um, Joe Bellum, O'Brien, Kirsten, and I took a look at kind of the height. We also looked at the sight lines <coughs> as far as being able to look at it from a safety perspective. So given the, the revised um, designs that he sent to the committee, um, we're comfortable with. And he felt lowering would not compromise what he's trying to do. He specifically said that in his remarks. So um, I really appreciate the presentation. So they're bringing this to us for um, approval of this initial design so that they can proceed with the rest of the fundraising. And um, so I think we need a motion for the initial so the process will be as, as tonight, is, as Joan said, is the initial design moves that concept forward. The second piece is once there's more final design and the contract pieces, I'll bring those pieces back um, for our policies before we start construction. And we'll approve the concept Sir. Um, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda is an update and discussion of the current TIF. If Gary, you have anything that you want to? Well, we can go any direction you want. <laughs> you know, it's, it has kind of growing. growing. Yeah, I didn't even follow too much of that in that. They'll come up with future projects or how they expand to that. Um, Gary, can you just clarify like when your next meeting is and what that process looks like? Yeah, it's looks like, like February 21st, so next Monday is the joint review board meeting when they will, we would initiate our vote. I think the village passed it already. Yeah. So that's when our vote is expected. Uh, do you need any input from us, Gary, or do you feel direct? Well, I prefer discussion on on how it meets our criteria and what we're doing and what everybody thinks of that. Um, I think I know how I'm, it meets it, but I would prefer everybody to be on the same page with that. So you have the two plans, uh, one of which is, is for the Hubdi building. Um, the interesting thing also with this TIF, if you, if you get looking through the whole thing, is, is they have some, some, well, I guess we should stick to what we think or what our position statement said we were going to do. And so the question becomes, would the Hovde project happen whether or not. And so they tore down the houses and you're at that at that spot. <laughs> I, I just wish I understood better what type of development it was that the city is trying to attract with all of these proposals and it seems kind of backwards to me in terms of the approach it's like someone comes to the village and says I'd like to do this I'd like some help with some money to do this so this is what I'd like to do how much can I get and that seems kind of backwards to me so Is it to restore and refresh a blighted area and replace it with something we really, really want, which is 140 units of apartments on Main Street? 
how does that fit into what we're trying to attract? I, I don't know. I don't understand. And, that. I, and I agree with you. I mean, I got a, I got working on this today or thinking about it as to my general position on what it is. And I can go through the but for test, and I can go through what tips were originally in that they were um, blighted area yeah. things to take care of. Um, and and I've said this before; it's changed what the but for test, and they still call it the but for test, but it isn't really. It it's changed from an example of the canning factory in town, but for. The cleanup happening and them being involved in that—that that would that not would happen not because a personal Correct. person couldn't take that on. Or yeah. another tip that was a good tip in Wanakee was the tip for the industrial park, but for Wanakee wanting that to to expand their tax base to make it not a bedroom community and do that, if they don't take a hold of that, nobody else is going to come here and say I'm going to create an industrial park here. So those were good examples of using that for a better good of the whole community to create a better community. What it's evolved into now in both these cases, TIF 8, which is Hubby, and TIF 9, or, or that whole project there, I shouldn't call it just Hubby because it, it'll eventually be Hubby, uh, the, possibly the other building, which is um, T Walls, possibly the, the one where they maybe are buying. The Legion, and or any facade or front That's stuff right. that they're trying to do, yeah, yeah. and any or parking and stuff they do. So it ends up becoming a slush fund for for doing business a different way, which is one of my points. They're creating a way. It's 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 gotten to be created as a way to take on debt outside of their normal debt, and so then it's excluded, and they're using it as another way to that they can do other business and, and not have this debt on their books. So, but I think we really have to stick to our our question of a, a but-for test and our question of, of would it happen or not in the, in the thing that we've created as our statement, which I don't have one of those here. <laughs> and so it fits into one, would it happen or not? And in, in my opinion, the, at the price that is in there, that the Hubby one got bought, that is going to happen. So in that case, it affects the rest of the taxpayers in the village because things are extended out and that tax base is not going to be helping provide for services on the rest of their stuff. In the Tormac case, it becomes the same. They're just asking for assistance on a project that they can choose to come here, they can choose to go wherever, and they end up making it a value decision. But to say that somebody else isn't going to come into our industrial park or not, I think in this case maybe it is, but for that they might come or they might not. But that doesn't mean somebody else isn't coming or not. It's a different but for test than the old but for was. Because of this blight, it's going to happen. They've changed. Nobody else can do it. Yeah. Now they're saying anybody coming here or not, and you and then you end up. It evolves into. Well, there's competition. Middleton's giving these right. out. Everybody's right. giving these out. They don't take into effect of where we are, what our schools are, the reasons that people come to this town to start with. It, it, it's like the biggest race, and who does it benefit for them to increase everything this fast? Who does it benefit? Is it these should be in place to benefit the taxpayers here or the people living here. When you take a road and you add a new road that benefits everybody here. In these cases, it's not benefiting everybody here necessarily in my case. Opinion. That's why we have to stick with what our Guidelines. Mission statement is on this, or our what's, what's the word for it? So, so our, our guideline, in, in a very sh okay. syn short synopsis, is <coughs> just as Gary said, um, did we feel like it would develop or not with or without the tip? And then the second piece we added here prior to this process getting going was with regards to value to the community. So that was the last, I think, clause that we added to it was is there additional value to the community that's part of this? 
that needs to be weighed in by the person who's levying the vote. So those are the two pieces that are kind of considered. You know, you can get into all these, and, and to say that it isn't either of these projects isn't a great thing for Wanakee. It's not. It is. They are. Mm -hmm. And to what extent the, is the community supposed to help with this? I don't know. That's it. That's that's the question there. I could give you. I wrote down ten things that, on my belief and and how these are. Now, the question to us is, how does this affect the taxpayers who voted us all into office? And we have a fiscal responsibility to look out for their interest, okay? Part of this, as a development and infrastructure thing is important, I think the village should support and encourage people to come here in areas that it could improve that. I, I don't disagree with any of that. And or use in some of this, it's parking, and stuff that could improve the downtown, help many businesses, help anybody who goes there. There's some good things in this. But in the end, to give some businesses an advantage over others that come to this community, that's a whole different question that the community should answer. <clears throat> but for us, we need to look at what does it do, us as fiscal representatives of people who voted us into office, and would this happen or not, is the important question. And when you look at Main Street and what has been created there, I don't see them not going forward, so that answers that question that is the other. I'll go back to one of the ones that was voted in last time, which is the Kilkenny TIF. And when houses which were getting billed at a very good pace in there got included in that TIF, that was wrong too. Because that was building that was going to happen anyhow. Yes. And we included that in there, and to me that in the, that one we would have voted against also because it would not meet the criteria of our position. It does not help the, the taxpayer in this town. And yes, there's some ways that you can stretch this around and say because of how we're funded it's different, but the bottom line is the taxpayer picks up the rest if, if it isn't done correctly. So on the first one, in my opinion, I'll give my opinion, I, I think it's a no because I think they're set up to do that and, and it's set up to be for, for that to happen already. Um, and even to that degree, the second building that's going there proves that there's people looking to do projects like that if they can find the right value and properties to buy in a community that they think can support that type of project. So all of a sudden you have two as an interesting way to say, is business looking to come here? Opinion on the second one? I'll give them both and then everybody can talk how they want. My opinion on that is also, it's, 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 it isn't the but for will they come to Wanakee. They can go anywhere they want. It, it's whether Wanakee wants to be that place that we're going to have everybody that wants to come here is going to ask us for a tip then. Because they are. Why wouldn't you? If they if they set the precedence of doing that everywhere. Now I've talked to many village people and they say they turn them down and, and this there's been many turned down. Well, that's a good one too. Then how do you predict who per, start picking who you give them to and who you don't? Well, that's back to my earlier comment. And or going to the businesses. To attract? Yeah, right. And, and I did think it was interesting. Uh, Chris Seller mentioned at the chamber update that you know in a lot that what they try to encourage in terms of tax base in Waikiki, 85 percent of the tax base is provided through residential housing i'm pretty sure i said i'm saying this correctly and that last little chunk of 15 percent is through businesses and they are looking to shift that valuation i don't know that this tip accomplishes that apartments basically aren't they more housing? I, you can argue that's a business on the one hand, I get it, but it's still, it, it's not job creating. So the two TIF districts, is it all that Main Street one, or are you voting on the Main Street one? There's two the There's one? two up for proposal right now. There's TIF 8, which is the Main Street one with Hub D, includes Allegiant, includes... That whole uh, big area. Yes, that correct. Like that. That's the one they adjusted the map on. And uh, the other one is for Tormax. Tormax, so which is in our industrial park. It's uh, roughly 13 or 14 acres. 
Um, infrastructure stuff, I think, happens anyhow because that's in our development. There's some things with that, but they're asking for $420,000. People don't read this stuff, of course. You can get into all kinds of things. The second tip with Formac, if you wanted to figure out administrative fees and uh, I got a note on it here someplace. In the end, it could total 100. It's a 420 thousand dollar tip. Administrative fees after if it closes when they wanted it to close, um, the administrative fees would be over 20 thousand dollars. If you went to the end of the TIF, it could be potentially be $134,000, depending on how that works out. For a $420,000 TIF. <clears throat> it's a game that's very, yeah. So, so at year 26, if it, they've got it highlighted saying that it potentially could be done by then, that doesn't add up to me, but because of value increases, um, but the administrative costs on it are $50,000 at year 26. If it extended all the way to the end, which some of these go, they can go 28 years. So the 400000 does that go in for our property improvements and so forth? Correct. And, and in most cases, I think, like, Tormac would pay, but then they don't pay the, the portion of the tax that goes towards a TIF they would retain. That's, or, or more so in the Hubby case, it's, it's Pay as you go, they pay for what they improve and do, and then they get their taxes back to the point. It, it's a complex I, issue with, with some different looks, but. I, especially on the Main Street one, you brought up the most crucial part of why TIF districts have become such a thorn more for outside the village than inside the village. For our school district, we don't represent only Wanaki. We have Westport and everybody else. And every time we, especially that theory one, you take residential area, this one, you had several houses already flattened that were residential property, they were paying into the school district. And if you create a business out of a residential property, and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, you just reduced your state aid every time we do that. So as we sit there and say we are going to create more business TIF districts out of res with somehow mixing residential into that math, we are shifting more and more of the property tax burden from the school district onto residential property owners. We're doing the opposite of what the village says they want. The but that's because of the state of formula. Now when you look at this TIF district, and I thought the paper did a great job writing it up by the way, um, you're, you're, you saw a map of one, you saw initially one property, which was to create an apartment building that was already in the middle of being created. That, that totally goes against the whole concept of what a TIF district was for, to get a business the help right. it needs to create that wouldn't have been created otherwise. And they're in the middle of creating it. Now we're going to say we have to give them, we have to shift property taxes to them to create it? It's already been done. Then we see the fact that they start adding in the American Legion, which is to create, my understanding, was the possible sale for a new retirement home. Which, what did we just do? We subsidized the retirement homeowner. We have a large retirement home in the village that now just got put in competition with someone we decided to give their tax money to, to help them compete against them. We just well, did we that in Tierney, too. Yeah, Tierney. We did right. it in Tierney. But the existing one over by Centennial Park where was their TIF district? And that's, they have to now compete the case with, with brand new buildings that we basically took money away from property tax owners in the entire school district to fund to create a business to compete with a business we already had. And their, the but for test totally fails because the original TIF district was concept on an apartment building that now they keep adding properties into that have no but for test against them. It's just give us some money to help make the sale work. I have two comments with that. First is, is uh, to be clear, the property that was there, they bought a million dollars worth of houses that are on there. That stays as it always was. So a million dollars of whatever their burden is, is paid taxes the same as before. So the school district gets their share or, or how that is. That doesn't change. 
but not it's any added value that right. they have that the tax that. dollars go towards paying off the gift money that's given to this owner. Right. The effect is now if they do right. some infrastructure things, I'm going to forget my second point already. I think mm -hmm. I already did. But the, the infrastructure part that they're doing as a, a thing to improve the village, I agree with that. I think they should do some stuff like that. And so, to me, you could do a TIF for infrastructure and other things to help in, in, in trying to attract people that see value in buying properties and changing it to whatever. That meets whatever goal they want to have in this, in this town to do stuff. To Julie's point, what do they want to make here? Yeah. Um, I think we should help out that with that. But TIFs like that will be done within a reasonable amount of time. Now, that, that's my whole thing. If you're going to do a TIF district, it should be for the whole community <coughs> to add value to the community, correct? It shouldn't take 20 years for it to help the community. It shouldn't take 28 years to help the community. If they would do something where they helped out, I have no problem with doing some incentives and or infrastructure help, uh, a street, how they hook the, pl the, the utilities if it improves the area and doing that, if it pays back in a, in a reasonable amount of years like five or seven because that's something that, that helps everybody but and improves stuff. You can't do a TIF district for a parking lot. Then you, you got to put... They've got it in there. I, I know it, but it's part of a building. It's part of... No, the, 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 the parking I'm talking about is for, for um, public parking. Yeah, but that's not... That's a TIF. That's they part of the TIF. That's all that's part of this part district. Of, that's part of the TIF. There's $2 million in there for, for, for future parking and or some parking solutions over behind buildings on Main Street in another area. But in a TIF, you have to have a property improvement, which would be a building or... or Correct. So whatever improves is so supposed to pay for this the expense. the parking lot and all that kind of stuff ties into the, uh, the building. So you, you can't have just parking a... Parking lot's over here in building. Yeah, but it's within a certain range. you got to be within a half mile of the TIF. It's all in the district. That's only if they draw the map. But the problem is they drew the map so long and far, your half mile range is basically from one end of Main Street to the other by the time they were done. So, so bottom line is yeah, I don't think either one of these TIFs uh, match our position statement. So you have our support and voicing your disagreement and voting as you see fit. That's what I would say. I agree. We can argue tips yep, that's until <laughs> next week. And we're still but only one vote of five, so yeah. we're they one vote of five. It's I would submit, though, we, you know, if the community does want to uh, change from a bedroom community, you know, into an industrial powerhouse, you know, I would, I would submit that uh, Tormac wouldn't do its project in Wanakee And that, you know, has the potential to uh, create jobs. Uh, it, it actually, I think, could potentially benefit the school system. But the problem I, is, Tormac's so. been a great benefactor to the school district already. They, right. They're a great employer in the town. I have no problem with that. But, yeah. but what, a, what so. kind of precedence do you want with all that? And, and what kind of, how do you decide that? And when you're in our industrial park, to say that, a couple. Okay, now we're now we're going the other way because you, you have di we have different tips that pass already. Renew Air gets a tip. Yeah. All right. They needed a million dollars to get everything they wanted, how they wanted it. The the building price could have dropped a million dollars. They would have had it. They didn't have to do a tip. But in this case, Owens and Miner gets the price they want versus maybe wait another year and the price goes down and whatever. So, yes, you can promote business that way and do that. Is that fair to everybody else to have to help uh, renew air? And I, great business seems to be expanding. They're hiring people they got to sign up. I'm not knocking that. That's competition with everybody else. But is that, is that right? I don't know. Did they get overpaid for that? I don't know. I, but I guess I you could, opinion. you know, I don't want to, Take this uh, for the rest of the evening, but uh, you know, you know, my point is the but for, you know, would they have come here or would they have uh, looked for a place in Madison, you know, with the same, you know, the same incentive packages? 
So if you're looking at it from a community improvement standpoint, you know, the business is here. We got jobs that are being created here. Uh, but, but we're, we're making we're not a just differential. But we, well, part of our school area. district is Madison. But but if you look at the area, you know, in, in all of this economic development stuff, it's not just the community, it's the region. But, you but know, Dave so brings up a good point. Our vote represents a wider share of communities. But are those people living in uh, Westport? Are they living in uh, Madison? You know, where, you know, just because it's located in <coughs> Wanakee doesn't mean that the village of Wanakee gets all the benefits. You know, you could be living in some of these other townships. And, you know, because that company is here, now the uh, business is Herbert. Somebody buys a house in Springfield or Vienna or you know whatever. So again, I'll go back to what's the village? What Julie's point? What does the village want, want to do with to this? I don't know. But as to be in Wanakee, we're in a great position close to Madison. Where people who want to work here work there. We are close to Highway 12. We're close to the interstate. You can get to anywhere you want with the other. We have good schools. We uh, have yeah. a great. Don't we have we have great uh, public works and and the people in this town that that manage our place. I think it's a great place to be. I think we are going to have growth no matter what. We're not a, a yeah. but for destitute that we have yeah. to give a bunch of money away to, to attract anybody to come here and if they don't yeah. want to be part of here that's fine too. They can go where other places have to give money away to do things. I don't think that's the case here. I think we're going to keep growing. I think to manage the pace of that is more important than, than accelerating this. And I think cases like both of these, who does it benefit? Does it benefit all the people in this town? Or does it, to, to go as fast as they want to go with a lot of these, or does it benefit the people that are, only the businesses that are coming here to some extent? I, 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 I would submit that uh, the Tormac one would benefit the uh, community. Uh, you know, because you are you know, changing the tax base, ultimately. <coughs> Uh, or you're shifting, you're potentially shifting, depending upon, to residential to business. Uh, you know, after that TIF district closes, obviously, I don't know if it's a 20 year or 30 year TIF district. But, yeah. You know, uh, but that one, you know, is, you know, we voted for the uh, Renew Air. You know, it, it was potentially a benefit for the uh, community. Uh, more housing. I think the housing that we've got here, uh, you know, that seems to be continuing on. Uh, we don't have uh, low income or moderate income housing necessarily, and maybe that's shifting, and maybe that's what some of this apartment stuff is. It's not they're, moderate. They're tearing down the affordable yeah. housing to build this they're, stuff. They said young professionals. <clears throat> I don't think. Low income is what they're going after. I get the feeling the rates on those apartments are going to be more than the houses that we're sitting there. I I don't know that. I don't know either. That, but uh, you know. Uh, move point. Do you have what yeah. you need from us, Gary? We need to. Or, kind of, you, are we voting? We need here? to move forward. We need to move on. So, okay. we'll get what you need. Thank you. Strategic planning and thanks for the discussion. That's Good. Um, so, 90 day outlook. You can just pull up the 90 day outlook real quick. Just scroll down. Just, I'm going to keep this real big picture tonight. I don't have a lot of committee meetings, etc., on there, but it's really meant to really highlight a couple things. First of all, February 27th, special board meeting. We set that a few months ago. The purpose for that is as that budget workshop with the board, administration, and our teacher leadership team. Steve and I have spent um, some time really thinking about how we're going to organize that night. So I just want to give you a kind of a foreshadow of the format. And if you have any input, we we'll would be happy to hear that. First of all, there's obviously a piece that we've got to do some front loading with information to provide the context of what we're talking about when we're looking at um, budget dollars and allocation. So we are looking to put together a, a PowerPoint presentation. We're actually going to get it out ahead of that meeting. We're going to actually do it on video in here where we'll talk through it, send it out to all the participants ahead of time. We'll try to keep it at a short enough duration that you can watch it in the, before you arrive so that we're not spending much of that night in presentation mode. We'll then take um, 
see if we can collect any questions ahead of time that we could then address at the beginning of our meeting on the 27th. And then we're looking to break it into really three kind of workshop areas that we'll rotate people through. Uh, one is focused on the 1819 budget. The second one is on allocation of resources. Um, we're doing some of the work with around the, the supply study, for example, about how we allocate dollars out to different parts of our organization. And then a third part really on allocation within a strategic planning larger longer term framework. So really looking at the evening being more workshop setting, gathering some input from the folks who are in attendance, but a lot of the, the information, um, you know, the direct instruction aspect of it, we're going to try and get that out ahead of time through a video so people can do that before they arrive. So that's kind of the context of what we're looking at and how we're looking to formulate that. Good and idea. So that's in uh, a couple weeks on the 27th. I think we go from 4.30 and will not exceed two hours. Uh, so that's what our plan is. So that's the 27th. The other ones I just want you to kind of start to think about. I don't need any decisions here tonight. Uh, but just to be looking at, because we ran into this last year, we have our regular board meeting in April. Between here and a regular board meeting in May, I think we had one, two, three, four, we have five, five meetings in a six week period. And that's just based off of kind of a feedback of far, as far as how we were bracketed by our regular board meetings. We have our evaluation meetings, we have a reorg meeting, we have a special meeting around curriculum. So I just want you to give some thought to that. Is that how we want to be structured between April and May? Um, there are certainly some options. And some, some of these are more extensive meetings than others. But I think it's just worthy of your looking ahead to see that. If there's something we can pair together or you want to do differently, let us let us know. I think we have some time at next month's meeting to kind of have that dialogue. And maybe Joe and you and I can think about that as well. But from a big picture perspective, the 27th of February, I wanted to point out, and then just kind of our schedule as we move through the spring. So with that, we can move on. Okay. Okay, um, next is facility maintenance plan. I'm actually going to let Steve kind of do the, the bulk of this one, walk it through. We have our partners from Findorf here. If you recall that this was a project that we started um, last spring, um, where we were talking about the, the facilities committee's direction and parameters as far as what we want to look at for a long-term facility maintenance plan. Um, Findorf's done a great job with helping us to really pull these pieces together. Joe Bellamo, his staff, have been very much involved. And what you're seeing tonight is starting to articulate kind of that big picture dashboard of what that plan is looking like and what are some of the things that we have to be considering as we move forward. So with that context, I'll let Steve kind of take us through some of the highlights of the presentation. We went into a lot of detail with this with the facilities committee. We'll try to keep it a little higher level tonight. All right, thank you, Randy. As Randy mentioned when we go through this, we're definitely going to keep this conversation tonight at a much higher level. We did spend quite a bit of time on various slides with the facility committee that I'll just touch on briefly tonight. The organization of this presentation is really broken down into what you see on the screen. Uh, we'll go through each of those sections as we go through the presentation. We're going to come back a little bit to the strategic planning piece. We're going to really kind of pull out the long-range facility maintenance plan, a long-range growth plan and facility maintenance plan towards the end of the presentation. Uh, just so you have some context on who was working on this, uh, we do have our Findorf team here tonight joining us. Uh, we have Matt Breinig, Matt Claggett, and Brian Malish who've spent quite a bit of time uh, working together on this project with the school district. I saw Joe's in the back. Um, Joe spent a tremendous amount of time working with the folks from Findorf on really putting this together and we certainly want to thank all of our contractors and members of our custodial maintenance team. They really put in a significant amount of time to really develop this. Uh, this background was just intended again as reminders of the steps that we've taken in the process. Um, we've been working on this uh, since May of 2017 when we originally presented a strategic plan to the school board and have been moving through the process ever since. Uh, 
one thing I want to point out as a frame of reference. This whole plan is based on a set of parameters that we identified and shared with the facility committee this fall. Um, the facility committee provided input to the administrative team as to uh, what they would like to see in this plan. That information was then shared with our partners, Findorf, and the custodial and maintenance team to, to use as this plan was developed. Um, so we had 13 parameters under which we were working through uh, creating this framework. One of the parameters which we did point out on, on this page was really the determination of a useful life for all elements of our facilities. It really formed the basis for putting this whole plan together. The plan is organized by each facility location, so there's a section for each school. Um, the category of within the facility um, the installation date, the lifespan, scheduled replacement cost, etc. What you really see here on the screen is just a snapshot from what it looks like at the beginning of the high school. Um, we really weren't going to inundate you with a 30-page spreadsheet that really had all of this information. What we really wanted to do instead was take you to the summary in the dashboard, but behind it uh, this is some of the detail that you can see that went into it. Um, documentation of the floor plans in all of our facilities. The, the symbol of the camera references where additional documentation was taken, like pictures and details of the equipment that you see throughout our school. Uh, all really leading up to, as Randy and I like to call it, a real a dashboard, just a, a high level overview of what that information is. Um, what this shows you, if you look at the top, um, it provides you with a 20-year average, and since this plan really was a 20-year average, um, you can see the identification of just slightly over $4 million in annual replacement costs for every single item that you would potentially see in our facility. So again, this dashboard view really covers all of the facilities within our district. You can see it by school. You can see it by particular type of category. Uh, this is another example of one of those higher level views. This one shows on the left hand side by school building. On the right hand side it shows it by category. All designed to really give us a, a high level look at what would the cost be if we were to replace all of these items on a 20-year on a rolling uh, plan. Uh, where we want to go with this is really where we need the engagement from the facility committee and the school board members. As a reminder, we are in the middle of a short-term plan. So we've started a plan in the 17-18 school year. That plan really is to build up our Fund 41, which is our capital expansion fund, over a three year period of time, and draw down the funds that we build up in Fund 10 as a result of the operational referendum question. So this has already been approved by the school board. We've started this process in the 17-18 budget. This process has two years remaining. So as you can see under number two, the portion utilized in this year was 498,000, leaving an average of 416,000 available in 1819 and 1920. What we'd like to do is identified under number three. We would like to request the facility committee meet again within the next month, and we bring back a plan to identify those maintenance projects that we would like to see occur within the next couple of years. So at this point, we feel like we've already established a plan for the next couple of years. What we really need to work on is what is our long-term plan. What we identified on this slide is how facility and capital maintenance projects have been funded by public schools traditionally. And that has included a blend of various different funding sources. As you can see here, we've identified referendum approvals. We've identified non-referendum approvals, both of which include borrowing. 
we've identified operational referendums, which we just utilized in our last referendum. We've identified a regular maintenance budget. We've identified Fund 41, which we have in place. And we identified an energy, energy efficiency exemption, uh, which is no longer allowed in the, since the 17-19 state budget. So historically, schools have used a variety of combinations to try to pay for these type of projects. What we really need to determine in our school district and really in the community is what is going to be our long-term funding model? What is going to be our blend in the Wanakee Community School District between the areas that we've identified on the screen? What is our ultimate goal, as an example, for Fund 41? How do we see using the borrowing process? How do we see <coughs> using our annual budget? The goal is to really identify what is our long-term strategy for how we seek to fund capital maintenance projects? Uh, why is that important? Uh, first of all, when you talk about the referendum piece, which was identified in the previous screen, districts traditionally have sought to fund the majority of facility maintenance projects through referendum approvals outside of the revenue cap. Two major reasons why. The first is that the cost of projects with a long useful life, like a roof or paving, can be paid for over a 20 year period of time to match a, the length of a loan. The second is that facility maintenance projects are not competing with the cost of educational related programming within the concept of the limited revenue cap funds. We spent some time talking a bit about the concept of referendum funding as a source for uh, long-term capital maintenance plans. And we talked a little bit about why um, that has been utilized. When you look at the charts you see on the screen, uh, it's a reminder that public schools have a 20-year rolling window under which we can borrow through referendum approvals. As every year is paid off, so as you know right now, the 17-18 fiscal year is more than half over, that year will be paid off and will be replaced by another year at the end, which is <coughs> zero. So at the completion of this fiscal year, you will see we have three years of our 20-year window at zero. You see that we have five years that are approximately $2.8 million, and you see a couple of additional years that are around $5 million. So it's important to keep in mind in any long-term conversation as to how we are going to fund our facilities, how does this 20-year rolling window for borrowing play into that decision-making process? Um, and just as an example, when you, when you talk about like a $5 million project, so a $5 million project, let's just say hypothetically to complete the additional work at Heritage, if it was borrowed through a referendum, what you typically would do is go out to the year 2030, 2031, put your $5 million on your debt service schedule, and if that referendum occurred this year in 2018, 19, you would pay for the interest cost only. So your cost to taxpayers would be, let's say, $200,000. If instead you went out and did a referendum to exceed the cap for 200,000, you only have $200,000 to spend to do a project and you cost the taxpayers $200,000. So the referendum process has been heavily utilized by schools because it does allow you to put in long-term plans as to what you want your tax levy to look like and how you want to accomplish these projects. So it's important to keep in mind when we get back, when we we're at this previous slide what is our blend going to look like here in Wanakee? What do we want to seek to achieve? Um, what do we want our goals to be? This is not something we expect to answer in the next month or two, but Randy and I would like to kick this back to the facility committee as we complete the short-term steps to then begin talking about the long-term <coughs> steps. And as important, 
we have to remember that under the facilities and district growth section of our strategic plan, we have that whole other part of it, which is what Mark Roffers presented to you in December, which has both short-term and long-term implications. It is incredibly important to connect what Mark shared with us in December with what we are learning now from this facility maintenance plan to really have a coordinated effort between those two areas. Uh, so our goal is to move forward to work with the facility committee and start having those conversations about what did we learn from the Mark Roffers report in December, what did we learn from the facility maintenance plan report in February, what do we need to do in the short term, and how do we need to get, begin planning for the long term. In addition to that, Randy and I have spent a lot of time talking about the statement at the bottom here, is we have to begin working together to connect and coordinate all of the sections of the strategic plan across the whole spectrum. Because what we want to accomplish in one area directly affects what we want to accomplish in another area. Because as an example, as a school board, you may have goals in a different area of the strategic plan that you would seek to use funds underneath the revenue cap to try to address, which may cause you to look at a topic like this in a different way. So even though we're saying here we need to connect both pieces under the facility section, we really need to connect the entire strategic plan together because all of these pieces really are interrelated. That's why Randy and I are starting to talk through once we get through this whole process this spring, because you've got a number of these still coming, how do we work together with the school board to start coordinating and connecting all of these presentations that you've been <coughs> seeing so far this school year? At that, I will turn it over to any facility committee members. Have anything that you wanted to share from the meeting with the other board members? Joan or Dave or Gary? First off, <coughs> I think Findorf did a great job in being so thor thorough that they've scared the heck out of all of us. <laughs> and what that number ends up being. And we haven't even seen the whole 30 no. pages. <laughs> but my question to you is, so what we were trying to address when we started looking at this process was that everybody's always reactionary. Yeah. And in, in my budgeting, when I do something or any business or any most homeowners, if they know they have something come up, they try and save for it and take care of it proactively rather than always being up oh, the roof's bad and now we got to go into debt, which is what we, most schools and us included have always done before. <clears throat> so with our long range planning and our, um, like you say, it fits into the plan to, to, and how it's going to affect other areas, we're trying to figure out at what level we can mix and do. But what I didn't realize or know before was how that's going to affect us is, is by putting it aside ahead of time, is that going to affect our aids and how that all works? So depending on the blend, we talked about those various different <coughs> blends, things like state aid are affected a little bit differently. Fund 41 is treated differently than Fund 39. So we really have to start getting into the details of the, those five options that we laid out because they are all different, like you noted. Fund 41 is more of a process where you can set aside money on the front end, keep it there, you don't always have to spend it. Uh, referendum processes are different. Uh, even your annual operating budget is a different way of looking at it. So what we're hoping to do is to have conversations with the facility committee and ultimately the entire board is to, for this community moving forward from now until 2030, how do we balance the growth identified on the, um, the plan, let me go back here, the, the plan that's on the right hand side of the green, the long range facility growth plan presented in December, how do we balance that between now and 2030 with on the left hand side, the facility maintenance plan and the needs identified there. Um, I view planning, Gary, as sitting down and sketching out for the community and engaging the community between now and 2030 
how do we want to coordinate all of these um, topics together so that as we look out towards the taxpayers, we have a plan that we can explain to people makes sense over time and ultimately protects the taxpayers from not necessarily having a large spike at any one time, instead planning for it over 10 to 12 year periods of time. But this is a very, uh, it's really a planning focused forward looking conversation that we would like to have. Um, and as we've gotten deeper and deeper into this, we've realized that um, there could be a strategic plan and goals in the, in the human resources arena that you might want to use a certain funding strategy for that might change the way you would want to look at this one. It all depends on what the priorities are and how all of these pieces end up coming together. Uh, we want to just emphasize that you know, making a decision on one section of the strategic plan in isolation is not a good practice without looking at the total scope and where we really want to go as an organization. I would submit that, uh, you know, when you look at uh, the committee structure, the facility committee kind of identifies, you know, where some of this discussion should happen is in the uh, budget committee, you know, um, where or how, how uh, debt structure. Uh, and Jack, I, I wanted to share with you that we had visions of you. We remember this room in a facility committee meeting, you sketching across, mm -hmm. and we hope that snapshot is what you were looking for. Because you remember when you put all those you things on there, the board? Did that look something. familiar? We were trying to <laughs> take your that, stuff. That, and that, that does look familiar. <laughs> you know, I couldn't read my writing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do, do remember that. So. But yeah, that's that a great. Would be my, uh, suggestion. Yeah, that's a great point. We're we're going to have to connect budget committee conversations and yeah. HR committee and facility committee and and these are quite in depth presentations as far as what it is that we are bringing forward. Whether it's the the Mark Roffers plan, which included a new enrollment projection and a new facility projection through 2030, or this plan, which is our one of the most comprehensive long-range facility maintenance plans that you're going to see, or our idea to have three to five-year goals in the human resources area, or all of the goals that you saw identified in the education area. It's connecting them all together and planning them that as we've realized as each one of these is coming forward, we do need to have a process at the end of this where we can look back at everything that we've learned in the last year and try to put a coordinated effort together. You know, I think, uh, the, you know, I, I see where you're going, you know, with the uh, referendum and, and so forth, but, you know, historically, I think uh, some of the things that have happened is uh, some of these maintenance items have been deferred for so long that uh, now instead of fixing a $100 item, you're fixing a multi-million dollar item. And, you know, how do we, you know, as we go through this process, how do we stay away from, from that? You know, if we can fix it, you know, with uh, 500,000 bucks, let's get it fixed uh, so that we can potentially, you know, maybe extend the life of something an extra year or so. Right, that's a great point, Jack, and I think it needed to start with identifying everything. Right. And this is our, a, a very, very comprehensive way of identifying it. And now we've got the information we need to really begin moving forward and doing the planning that I know all of you want us to be doing. It's taking all of the feedback we've heard from you in various different committees, uh, not being reactionary, knowing what the amount is, planning for it moving forward, we now have the information that's going to allow us to do that. And I applaud you guys. And I think uh, you know, putting Great into, start. In, into <coughs> a document uh, like this, what's the mechanism now to maintain it, you know, add, delete, uh, yeah. things like that. you got to make some decisions. I mean, with the biggest I think the yeah. example I've used a few times is, is lights. So this room. This room is on, or this building is on the plant. I think, Brian, you said it was like your five or seven. 
it's two hundred and twenty two thousand dollars I remember your numbers mm -hmm. is that you go through to do the lights and to change them from these ballasts to whatever else Prairie Elementary was at the point of that's on the plan that's in year one I believe because the age of those lights are at the point of where they would get upgraded to the LED fixtures that's eight hundred thousand dollars now obviously you walk into Prairie the lights were fine there's an energy efficiency <coughs> piece there I believe where your stadium is in the project there's some additional funding outside of fund 41 or referendums that we have for those pieces so there is a piece of trying to now take all of this data of the all-in plan and decide kind of where do you go I mean the, the new intermediate school has we know in 13 years if that was our number for carpet that's where it falls so where what is that how is that gonna to play out Arboretum is in year one with or year two with um, the carpeting at, the, at that facility. So it's now a point of taking that data and making some decisions as far as where we go. I know Gary, you and I had that conversation as far as if you follow it year by year, that may not be necessarily what, what absolutely positively needs to be done. But then you have the flexibility through the spreadsheet to move them right. on, on the plan so you can you can strategically defer them, not defer them because you're because of the finances. When you go into a uh, referendum, you know, that's right. that's a bucket of money. So you're not gonna do a referendum every year, you're coming during right. five to ten years. So do you let stuff <coughs> go, you know, for ten years so that you can throw that into the referendum? Right. You know, I guess you know, those are some thoughts on that. Well, I think during that facility meeting and part of the reason over the years, I, I can't think how many times we've talked about the facility plan over time was the idea that just like this last referendum for the intermediate school it worked out that by doing it when we did it in the amount we did it in the property tax increase for the average homeowner was zero now you could say don't do the referendum and we'll all get a property tax cut yeah and then you're going to pay for it a couple years later when you get a massive increase by doing the referendums and setting them up this 20-year plan will allow you to to look at your maintenance five years from now, say, you know what, we're looking at, you know, what's the next school going to be, which <coughs> we learned back in September. We can see something's going to happen in some number of years. And then looking at your maintenance plan, and you put them together, and you start figuring out the growth in the community so that you can make the next referendum be another zero property tax increase. The idea is to try and pick those windows where that can happen so you're not doing massive jumps at a bad time so that you're causing that increase. And I mean, the intermediate school referendum was perfect. It was great timing. Now we've got to set up the next one, and this plan will allow us to add the maintenance on top of the new building so that you can keep at that same level, which is, we've done it once. I'm, we'll see if we can pull it off again. No, I, so we uh, got to do it before Steve retires. No, I, uh, I respect <laughs> what you're saying. Uh, I'm not right. saying I'm against referendums, and I no, no, think, I did. Uh, no, I, I just I, I think I, I think I I follow the strategy, and I think it's a good strategy. It, it's just I'm just cautioning that uh, if we don't have the next building referendum, and you know, putting off deferred maintenance or our doors and windows are falling out and things like that which forces us I think I think what you guys did is is great you know on the uh, facility plan and you know identifying when everything needs to be done you know because that gives the board and everybody a horizon to look at well and what what these guys did for us in the plan shows you is everything at its maximum level and there's there's you can buy Calvin Klein jeans or you can buy Pharma Fleet jeans there's, there's, there's ways that you can bring this to a different level. There's also, um, it isn't just referendum, but it, there's operational, that's the blend. Where do we get this from and how do we make it work with the rest of our planning so that we're not deficient in other areas? So there, there's ways I think we can make this work. It's and, it, and it's great, you know, like lights, you know, if, uh, if there's incentives out there to, uh, to go yes. after the incentives, that might move up so that you can capture those incentives you know so there's going to be a lot of change and fluidity in incentives and and uh, different tax policy and things like that but you know it gives you a little bit and like I say I applaud 
what you guys did. So, so we'll bring back the next iterations of this through the <coughs> facilities committee and eventually we'll have some of these things work their way through budget as well. Thank you, Fendor. Yeah. Have you done this Thank for you. others? I, we have, but not, certainly not to this extent. And I think you guys are setting yourselves up well for future planning. And, and other districts are not doing this. Um, I think it's, it's oftentimes a part of the initial referendum planning, um, specifically for a, a building or two, uh, but not district-wide and not in the same context that I think you guys are talking about. So um, I think you're doing a very good thing by thinking about this and in terms of your buildings and long-term planning, so it's great. We're so happy Pete, to get that quote. <laughs> Let our community know that this What's that? I, I just think we're so happy to help you jump higher and deeper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big Brian wants to go a little deeper yet into his friendship. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have uh, planning with forecast five. Steve, yeah. you must be up again. He's up again. I mean, yeah. this is going to fit right into kind of continues on with the whole conversation of our analytical planning, but it also fits into what we'll be talking about as we run into the 27th of February. So, Steve, I'll let you kind of take off on this one as well. Great. Thank you, Randy. So, with this presentation, one of the things that we're going to do is take a look backwards quickly as to what it is that we've accomplished in the last year. And then we really want to take a look forward to say what it is that we are really looking forward to working on as we move forward. Uh, again, strategic planning, uh, what we're talking about right now is under the budget and finance section, under the strategic budget planning section, the analytical planning piece down there at the bottom. I wanted to remind you, we gave this presentation a year ago and we identified three goals. I think it's always important to take a, a moment to look back and see what did we accomplish with those goals that we identified. The first goal that we identified was a budget goal. Uh, and I, again, just recap for you what it is that we worked on in the last year really to meet our budget goal. Uh, when you start looking at it, all identified like this, you do realize that we did accomplish you know, quite a few of our goals within the 1718 budget, including things like QTI salary adjustments, um, our short-term strategy for Fund 41, the Warrior Stadium project completed, the wellness clinic trial period, uh, what we approve for increases in compensation this fall. Um, our second goal was what I I'm calling here the reallocate goal. Um, if you remember, we started looking at analytics to try to find opportunities to allocate our resources in a better way. Um, one of the things that we shared last year with you was that we were leading the county in communications expenditures. As a board, you approved an investment in new telecommunications equipment at three of our facilities and, and also three of our schools, also at Bethel Circle to really address what you see on the screen here. Uh, we're really pleased with the way that is going and you will see in the budget process how we're gonna be able to reallocate these dollars. Um, based on seeing this analytic last year, um, we knew that we needed to continue to invest in energy efficiency <coughs> projects, which as a board, you approved the middle school gym lighting project um, last summer. Based on this visual, uh, we knew that we had an opportunity to increase our facility rental revenues. Um, the school board uh, then revised the policy. So um, last spring, you revised the policy on facility uh, rental fees uh, based on seeing this visual, which we were able to increase our budget uh, in the 17-18 year. Um, in addition, we bid out our transportation costs that resulted in a cost reduction. The board approved paying off the Bethel Circle loan, which allowed the funds to be allocated to Fund 10 instead of principal and interest payments, and we allocated the remaining operational referendum funds. Um, in addition to that, you did see last year that we uh, were the highest spending district in the non-capital object areas, supplies, non-capital equipments. 
Um, we have distributed an allocation of resources survey to selected Dane County and State of Wisconsin district peers. Uh, we had a forecast five goal. Um, is Kurt, yeah, Kurt's back there. Kurt and I attended the uh, national conference uh, in Illinois back in October, which was an, a great experience for us to be there together. Um, Kurt, Tim, and I attended Forecast 5 regional trainings in DeForest and in Wanakee, um, and I've also att attended additional financial related trainings. Um, it's been great to sit through the trainings with uh, Kurt and Tim as well to kind of understand the connection between some of the data that they look at and some of the financial data that I look at. Um, as you know, our district was awarded a Project of the Year Award for really our use of visualization data, and we're looking to continue pushing that forward as we move into the next budget cycle. Um, in addition to that, um, we've tried to take a leadership role in really on the topic of using data analytics to improve the alignment of resources. Um, I've been involved in several presentations on this topic so far. Um, Randy likes to push me outside of my comfort zone, so on this one I jumped way out there. Um, back in October, as an example, I partnered with a school district in Pennsylvania to do a presentation at the national conference. I'm actually going to be attending the school board conference in April. Um, to discuss this topic. I'll be also presenting again at the Business Manager Conference in May. Um, it's all really designed to create those partnerships um, where groups of individuals are working together towards that common goal of really using data analytics to Im <coughs> improve the alignment of your resources and seeing how this works in other states and seeing how other districts use it allows us to have a better understanding of how this can be used in our district. We've already developed an 18-19 budget timeline. Um, that will include uh, the first draft of the budget planning process coming in March. Uh, one change that I want to note for you is I'm looking to create a comprehensive budget planning document that now would and in will include not only the, the planning documents that you will see in March, but also will incorporate the multiple drafts of the budget. I want to just have one source for all of you as board members to know where to go and to see our financial information. So there won't be separate documents created, it's just, just going to be one source that we will use to continue um, working on budget planning. Uh, I'm going to be introducing new da data analytics, multi-year data analytics, and then high-level academic data into um, the budget planning process. I'm going to be introducing a new state-level peer group um, in addition to the Dane County peer group, our comparables that we would like to look and see how they're doing. Excuse me, Steve. Yep, so the high-level academic data that you're going to yep. be using, is that going to be stuff like, what, graduation rates? and? Uh, so it's the data that Forecast 5 has that's data that's reported from the state level um, that we can now bring into data analytics just like we can on the financial side. Um, so I'll be showing you what it looks like. It's just going to be really high level overview. Things like AC, things that you've already seen ACT from scores, Tim, but it's just presented AP, in, AP scores, yeah, in a different kind of way. So it's presented through the Forecast 5 okay. approach, um, not intended in any way to replace any of the, the presentations that Tim does, but just to show information as to how it's also presented in this tool. Um, so I want to introduce some of the academic information that they are providing as well. Um, and introduce the addition of a, a new peer group. Going okay, through. does that link up then with like WiseDash at DPI? Um, um, so it's it's very, Peggy's question is does it link up with WiseDash? It's a, it's a different way of looking at the information. Oh, but, but that's the data read, source. But it's the data okay, source. Okay, the data. Yep. And then the other question is um, I, I, there's a lot of data analytics. Are there any scenario building capabilities in that as well so that when it comes time to predicting based on different state budget? different monies that might be available from whatever source. Yes, the scenario build, building is built into the 
budget forecast model. It's yeah. only really on the financial side, okay. but it is it, that is a capability. Okay. Uh, one of the newest tools, which was great for Tim and Kurt and I to learn how it works, is the ability to analyze school level peer groups. Um, within five to ten minutes, we now have the ability to find the closest schools in the state of Wisconsin that look just like your school. Um, so what you see on this screen is a snapshot these are the 12 most similar middle schools in the state of Wisconsin compared to our middle school based on student demographics. So you can very quickly pull across the state of Wisconsin a group of schools that looks exactly or as close to your school as possible and show things like staffing, show things like academic performance. This is just one visual. This is the Wisconsin Department of Public uh, Instruction report card accountability rankings pulled in for just this specific group of schools. You can pull in a whole bunch of other things, but this is just to showcase where this is going. Uh, this is going down to the school level where you are going to be able to very quickly create peer groups and pull up any data that you would like this type of analysis was not possible before the creation of school level data in peer groups. Um, in addition, um, what I've identified here, uh, the most significant accounting change that's taken place in decades is occurring in the 1819 fiscal year. The federal government is now requiring school level financial data to be reported to the Department of Public Instruction and then ultimately reported to them. Um, so currently, for school districts, we do not report any of that information to the state of Wisconsin or the federal government. But effective with the 1819 fiscal year, we will now be reporting our financial information in a completely different way. So we are going to have to go through and make sure that the majority of our expenditures are assigned at the school level. The ultimate goal and the reason why this information is being shared is a strong desire to look at school level financial data to seek out inequalities, not only within your own district, but across the regional area. So ultimately, the federal government and the state government is going to be able to look and see how, what resources are being identified and allocated to school buildings. And things like per student resource allocation will be very easy to find. And that's what I mentioned at the bottom. With this change, with school level financial data reporting taking place, data analytics at the building level will be able to incorporate academic staffing and financial data all in one place. So you will be able to, in the future, pull up a particular school, find the closest schools to them, find the financial resources that that school has, find the staffing resources that that school has, and just map it all out together. <clears throat> and so this piece is new. It's going to be a significant change, uh, but it's going to lead to uh, a whole different level of analytics coming in the future from the school level. Jack? Is this uh, accounting change uh, for both public and private schools? Or is this just sense. public schools that have to report? Tim, do you know? Is Tim back there? Does this asset change apply to private schools or just public schools? So private schools do not receive ESSA funding except through us. So these uh, requirements don't apply to private schools. Okay. Not even voucher schools? Uh, no. no. So it's just spending. It has nothing to do with even sources of funds. It's just the spending, right? Spending, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we've identified goals for 1819. Um, under the budget or the balanced okay. budget goal, we've added aligns resources with the strategic planning initiatives of the district. Um, number two, implement strategies and process improvements to reallocate existing budgetary funds to areas of greater priority. 
Three, engage the entire administrative team and opportunities for staff development with the Forecast 5 products. Now that Tim, Kurt, and I have had quite a bit of exposure to it, we think it's important for the entire administrative <coughs> team to be able to see what's capable with using these products. Uh, the fourth one, and this is a pretty significant change, analyze the allocation of resources survey and develop a model to allocate resources from the district level to the building department level beginning this year with non-personnel budgets. So this is part of what Randy said that we want to do at that meeting two weeks from today. It is also something I'm going to be doing with the budget committee as we move forward over the next couple of months is really creating an allocation process that identifies how we distribute those resources from the school. Um, and we have a survey that the budget committee did have a chance to look at and provide input into, as well as the administrative team, that really shows us the differences in the way that we are doing it compared to other schools. So we have quite a bit of data now that we could take a look at to suggest some changes to the way we're currently um, <coughs> allocating resources. And then the fifth one, connect the strategic planning initiatives together through a long-term resource allocation and funding model. Um, so we've identified those five goals uh, for moving forward into the next budget process, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about any of the information on this presentation. Last item that he had on there was the connection between. You've heard that in multiple presentations tonight. That's going to be a piece that we've got to figure out how we are going to filter that around our table here, whether that's through some of the board development time or some other things that we have to do as far as carving out the time for us to handle some of that discussion. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, summer school classes and fees. Sheila's here to walk us through the, the summer school class list and fees that you found in your packet. So Sheila, thanks for being here. Sure, so hopefully it's pretty easy. I present summer school to you in boots and a wool sweater tonight. Um, really our courses are mostly the same. We had a couple of new additional. We had a lot of rename, which is just due to our new program. So elementary engineering had too many characters. It became build it. The description will be the same. Um, and we rotate a lot of the curricula in K-6 at least, so kids could take it a couple years in a row and it would be different for them. Questions you have for me? Were there any changes in fees? I mean, this is still, I, I admit I don't know what the fees were last year off the top of my head. No. So they're, they're all pretty much the same? Pretty much the same. With the exception we had two, and we're right where we need to be. Uh, mindfulness we could do at a Zero, it's a new because it will have a district budget associated with it. The artist in you replaces Crafty Creations and it went from $20 to $15. Um, if you want to scroll down to the bottom, there was, um, there we go, back up a little. Okay, preschool aquatics. What does two asterisks mean and why does that aquatics cost but so the bottom <laughs> swim session should have had two asterisks instead ah. of one. Um, it's asterisked because swim lessons are prorated over the July 4th where they only have two, so it won't be 45. It'll be prorated for the two days instead of all five. Well, why does that one? I, I'm why does that why one does do that? One that cost money in the other swim classes then? Sure, good question. Um, the reason for that is what we can submit to DPI and the rules that go with that, because they're preschool aquatics and they have to be three or under, they fall into a different ball game and a set of rules about what we can and can't do. Steve, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, at that age, we don't submit for summer school minutes, so therefore we're not under the restriction. Of the, the other swim courses we do submit for state aid for um, reimbursement and when you do submit for state aid you can only charge actual supply costs and when it comes to something like swimming um, we'd have to create something to you charge can't people charge for chlorine. so it can't charge for chlorine we cannot charge, no, so we keep it at zero 
You need a motion to approve. Is that what they need here? Yes. Yes. <coughs> so move. Second. Um, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Sheila. Great summer school program. <coughs> Um, new clubs and organizations, yeah. um, we have one. Yep, the, the new club I have today is actually coming out of a sequence that normally they come through our co-curricular committee and then here. This one I am just bringing it here because I felt there was a few interesting nuances with it. Uh, first of all, it's being forwarded by two of our senior students that they would like to try to get launched before they are out of the high school. So it's really an, an eco club focusing in on some of the environmental pieces. Um, and Elizabeth Hikes has agreed to serve as a, an advisor to that. There's no cost as far as payment for the advisor at this time. It would fall under the same criteria where it needs to be, has to show sustainability for a three year period. But given that it's being proposed and that there's interest, as you can see in your packet from students to join this, I thought this would be something that I wanted to try and move forward at this time in the interest of trying to launch a real positive club at the school. Motion to approve. Okay. Second. Second. Any, any discussion? This one's asking for $100. They have stuff. Yeah, what? we'll figure that out. Uh, there's, uh, this is basically just some seed money before they start um, doing any fundraising or doing any concession stands or anything of that nature. So just get some off the ground. Okay. It's not something that we have to approve that dollar amount. We can find that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, a couple of correspondence tonight. One in your packet is just the notification of the AP District Honor Roll. That's something we've received the last few years, so I just wanted to highlight that. I believe Brian has a banner that's going to be in the high school or is in the high school. So what does that mean? Brian, do you have any background on what it, how we get on that list for AP Honor Roll? Yeah, the AP, the AP banner is up in um, that's half no. Over the course of the last few years, and, and really what it is, it's um, what they look for is an uh, increase in the number of students that are accessing our AP classes, and along with that increase in enrollment, basically that, again, the performance level is either maintaining or increasing as well. So, Perfect. Yep. Those that are the two key awesome. components. Yeah. I'm very pleased about that. So, good news. Thank yeah. you. The other correspondence is, is, again, Brian sent me a notification. These did not make your packet, but I received them today for two of our National Merit Scholarship competition. People who are continuing on are Sophia Liu and um, Alexis Anenson. So, wonderful news for them. Thank you. Um, on to committee reports, starting with budget. Steve will probably cover some stuff. The only thing I wanted to comment <coughs> is uh, our audit with our new audit company. I think the, the committee in general is very happy with their thoroughness, and I think Steve is too. It's it's been an improvement, uh, so it's good to see. Gives us things to improve on. We had a number of items we discussed. There there aren't any action items that you see this evening. A number of them we'll continue to work on, like the audit report, as Gary mentioned. Um, a few other pieces in there we continue to bring back. Uh, for discussion as the months go on, but at this time there weren't any action items to forward to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Um, curriculum committee? Uh, we received reports from the intermediate and the middle school on their technology uses and numbers, and um, what was especially refreshing was not only was it an update of information, but um, Chris Hetzel from the Intermediate also had some very positive suggestions for possible solutions and um, ways we can make better use of resources. Does that pretty much hit it on the head, Tim? That's exactly right, Julie. Uh, and we'll be bringing a summary to the next curriculum meeting and right. then for the March meeting of the full <coughs> board, uh, you'll begin to see some of this at uh, your level. Thank you. Um, facility committee. Seen some of it. Well, the main thing is um, you did see the one presentation already on the plan. The second part is about the baseball field, which does require an approval. Let me just uh, uh, what you see is we had the uh, booster club members and um, 
Coach from our baseball team talking to the facilities committee. If you recall, about 18 months ago, we approved actually improving the dugouts as a project for the varsity field. Um, the booster club decided not to move ahead with that project in light of trying to have a bigger vision for some of the work that they would like to accomplish. So what you see on, on this screen, is if you can scroll down for me, I'm going to start with the JV field first. That's perfect right there, Rebecca. What you're basically looking at is you have dugouts in the JV field where we do not have them currently. And then we have dugouts up here at the varsity field. There's another one up here uh, where they want to do improvements to them. Uh, they also want to add some additional pieces, uh, a bullpen at, the, at the, um, the JV field. They also want to do what's called a top rail along the fence line. So if you think about the, uh, the chain link fence, there's a cap that goes on that. So if, if a student had to reach for a ball over the top, that they would, it's a safety feature. If you can scroll down. Sorry, up to the varsity field. There you go. Um, they're looking at a, a new scoreboard on both of the fields and also something called a batter's eye screen, which is a screen that they put in the outfield so that when the batter can see the ball better as it's being pitched to them, otherwise they lose it in the sky. So well, they just have LED bulbs. Yes, there you go. So basically they're looking at this as kind of their larger vision as far as for improvements to this whole facility. Their first phase is to do the dugouts and the cap to the top of the, the fence rail. Um, they're looking to, they would actually like to still accomplish that before the spring. So there's potential that I may be back here in March with more specific detail on their first phase. And then the other pieces, the, uh, the, the bullpens, there's looking to do an upgrade to their sound system and also add a concession window into their storage area, and then also look at adding a storage area, that being at a, at a future phase to come um, probably in the next year or so. But obviously they have to bring these things forward um, as they have them planned out and as they have the funds. The facilities committee reviewed this and has approved the first phase for your recommendation tonight. So the first phase again is the dugouts on both the JV and varsity field, plus the, the cap to the fence. They also want to continue to look at their, their fundraising through Class Community. Um, they have some individuals who are interested in donating towards the project and then also resurrecting the pennant program that they've had on the lights for the last number of years. So we'll be looking for um, action tonight to approve them moving forward with this project. So they're not asking for any money. They're fundraising it all themselves and they just want this is yeah. This is this our is totally to a, do the work. yeah. This falls within our policy on facility improvements, and they are funding it. What we are what, the reason it's coming here is our policy states that the, the concept has to be approved and then the final pieces have to be approved before they start building. So again, I'd like to acknowledge and thank them for their hard work on this, and to make the community more aware of how much our programs are funded and depend on. Absolutely booster group and private donation. So Absolutely. at some point, maybe that's worth a bigger discussion because if it's safety features and basic stuff that makes playing the sport mm -hmm. safer and better enhanced, mm -hmm. what is the district's responsibility on that? I mean, it's great we have this amount of help, but right. if we're offering programs, shouldn't we be providing the basics? Great conversation. Yeah. So we do need approval. I'll move approval of the plan. Second. Suggestion. <laughs> yes. Thank you. With thanks. Um, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, next is policy. Um, policy committee has a number of policies. Have you five different policies in front of you? Some of these are are being updated to just be in line with what our practices are. Some of them are in line with some changes in law, for example, bringing back the part-time open enrollment that went away for a, for a cycle and now has been brought back. So that is a, a, a bringing back, it's a rewrite, but it's a, a bringing back the part-time open enrollment piece. And then the medication administration is just articulating the um, ability for school staff to administer NERCAP. So I know that we have, um, Steve is here for 
who has put together the part-time open enrollment. Um, Tim has done most of the ones that dealt with the student assessment and graduation, and Kurt was the medication. So if there's any specific questions or you'd like us to walk through those, we'd be happy to do so, whatever your pleasure would be. This is a first reading, so there's no action required. And then the one thing to note is that the old, what used to be called youth options, is not really post-secondary opportunities are two different types of things. That's Correct. So, and I know you had, there were some questions from the committee with regards to that, um, with regards to what we could, what we could do if somebody didn't pay their fee. So if you want to fill in a couple of the blanks that were from the committee level that you've now researched there. So uh, the reason why we have uh, a revision for policy 343-4, which is that one, that one now titled only post-secondary mm -hmm. opportunities, there were some significant changes in um, last year's biennial, biennial budget that replaced youth options and course options with these programs. Uh, there's a lot that's being clarified. Uh, however, the deadline for students applying for fall courses is coming up on March 1st, and we thought it was important to begin getting some forward-looking guidance on one piece uh, in particular uh, as we went into this process. And so, um, I think the key thing uh, that the committee asked was, uh, if a pupil receives a failing grade or fails to complete a course, uh, do we have the ability, do you as a board have the ability uh, to preclude their uh, future participation in that type of program? Uh, and we knew that was the case when we met with the committee for the Start College Now part of the programming. That is what applies to technical colleges. Uh, subsequent to this, uh, sat down with a representative from DPI and was able to clarify this does also apply for early college credit, which is the four-year program. The other thing that I was able to clarify um, with both the technical college system and the DPI representative subsequent to the committee meeting is that um, you may remember for youth options, we had a limit on the number of post-secondary credits we would reimburse a student under youth options. Uh, we set the level at the lowest allowed under state law, which was 18. Uh, there was a little ambiguity as to whether each program had its own cap. Um, DPI and the tech college system were able to clarify jointly uh, that there's a single cap combined for both Start College Now for the technical college and early college credit for the, uh, the four years. That's an important thing mm -hmm. for you as a board to weigh in on in particular because um, you know our assumption administratively has been because we had an 18 credit cap uh, for youth options that you would wish to retain that cap for these programs which are really the successor to youth options. But it's not a requirement under state law that you set the cap at 18. We just felt that was consistent with our prior practice. You could set it higher if you wish to not even have a cap, but that would mean we'd be paying for more credits. So um, how is this affected with like the uh, capstone and dual credit programs with foreign language and so on? Do those count under this or is that that's separate? We don't know yet. Uh, the way the law is written today, uh, dual credit for your classes like our CAP classes, yes. Spanish 5 and 6, yes. French 5, are covered by this, which would be a cost shift. The other ways this operates are actually cost favorable to us, but that would be a negative cost shift. However, uh, there is uh, a <coughs> bill pending in both the Assembly and the Senate, uh, it seems to be moving forward very well, that would carve out high school-based dual credit for your classes like CAP from uh, the control of the <coughs> college credit program. So it's likely, um, we'll hopefully know within a month or so, that this won't be an issue. Because it might make it more likely, if it does include those classes, that some of our students would blow through that 18 credit. It certainly would, yes. But I would say, I mean, if, if it doesn't, we would have a few things to consider. So. But we're we're operating under the assumption, it's an important question, Julie, yeah. we're operating under the assumption that these trailer bills will pass 
and this will be exempted. Uh, but if it's not, there will be two important questions to consider. One is the cap, and quite frankly, our financial exposure for this could be on the order of forty to fifty-five thousand right. dollars annually. We we would at least have to have a discussion about our participation in that. Right. But we're hopeful that it won't come to that. <clears throat> so you set it at eighteen, what's the minimum? Eighteen. And that's anything that they take is paid for in general by us. So everybody, so, in, the, everybody in the district pays for somebody going to college. Partly, yes. So if they're taking a two-year technical college, um, it's fully covered by the district um, at whatever rate the technical college charges us. If it's under early college credit program, uh, four-year campuses like UW-Madison uh, are restricted to charging only one-third of the regular tuition for the course. If it's, you know, like uh, UW colleges like UW Baraboo or Rock County or something like that, it's a 50% level, but their tuition's lower. Uh, there is a fund in the budget to reimburse us partially. So if a student is taking a course and we grant them high school credit and post-secondary credit for the course, we can get up to 25% of that reduced level reimbursed by the state. If they take it for post-secondary credit only, the student and it's kind of laid out, we don't really okay. get into the weeds here, okay. but the student's family is responsible for up to 25% if they don't have financial need, and the state might, if their funds available, reimburse us up to 50%. So yes, there is still a significant district contribution, but that operation of it's actually much more favorable to us than the old youth options was. We're paying, but we're, we would pay less. Any other questions? So um, these will all be brought back next month. Mm -hmm. These will be brought back. Some of the changes that Tim reflected will bring back yep. in the next iteration of the policies, mm -hmm. and we'll vote next month. Thank you. Um, Goals Committee. Five minutes from the meeting are in our packet, and I guess the one thing if we wanted to spend any time discussing was um, the. Uh, Okay, uh, the performance indicators, as the committee discussed the board priorities and performance indicators and um, the discussion about the communications audit was uh, we had around the table. And uh, the committee recommended, um, based on some of the things that we already heard about, you know, the potential costs and the resources that needed to be allocated to this in line with other priorities that we have, that the district not necessarily move forward with this priority uh, because it's um, really does need to focus resources on other things right now. So just wanted to let the rest of the board know that and if you had any thoughts on that recommendation, I thought. I do have to say that part really disappointed me because this has been on our radar screen for a long time and it just feels like it can we continue to kick down the road. So if if the audit is not the place to start because the audit is too expensive. Just, I hope we make sure we're doing something. Well, I think we are doing a lot with communicating. Well, maybe not a lot, but we, you know, I think communication has been a topic throughout the whole year. You know, Peggy has put together the first letter. We've talked about that. We have the board governance part that we've added to our work. Um, we are communicating a lot. It, a unified message. Oh, and this is the um, yeah, formalized communication strategies and plan. Right. I, I guess just after the workshop, especially that I attended with Randy at the state convention, it, I think it's past time that we have a staff position dedicated to that. It felt that way to me. That's just my opinion at this point. Yeah, I guess I would uh, say that it would be a tough sell um, without having some of the other priorities taken care of, but doing a little bit more research into uh, into it, and having a plan. I guess uh, the question, you know, if you brought a uh, full-time communication person on, and 
looks like that's the direction that that's what we'd like to do. That you'd like. What what it what it what is that position cost? Yeah, is that that, uh, 40, yeah, that, that's one of the pieces of data to share. I mean that's it can be anywhere from uh, is it full time, part time? It's full time most districts. Most districts have them full time. You're probably looking your average is about is about sixty, sixty five grand. That's kind of where you're at. I mean, you've got places that are more, and you got places that are less. I mean, that was I've got a handle on the, uh, the Wisconsin School Public Relations Group did a survey of all the districts that have these. So you have anything from much smaller districts to us that have full time folks to places that are larger, and you've got a lot of folks like us that don't. And you have just what are they doing? What kind of work are? They, what's their job description pieces? What's their cost? So you have I have some of that data. Um, is that fully burdened or uh, the 65? That's no, that's that's probably just the base salary. That's probably with you. So you're looking, your, your total cost is probably 80, 85 with, with roll ups. I'm curious if there, I wrote a note earlier on that when you were talking about it, if there isn't a way to, <clears throat> when you get into technology people, half of what that job is is being able to manage and go through technology people and usually you have somebody that can do that and maybe you can get somebody that does both and or half our mass media classes and all that stuff just like you did with the scoreboard is the same type of technology and whatever it was that so maybe you can that, find that, some way to yeah. manage both and then you get a better usage out of them to, to do the other. Or to tiptoe into it with some kind of internship or I mean is there a grad student that wants to launch a project and write a paper on it and be a case study? I mean. You know, can we be more creative in terms of... There, there's other things we can be doing. Right. This it. goal was create an audit yeah. and then position yourself for a position as a communication specialist. So the, the committee stated that they thought we should put our efforts, at least temporarily right now, somewhere else. Got it. Doesn't mean communication stops. Yeah. I mean, and that's part of what I wrote up in the, in the handout was looking at... I mean, I'm meeting with Kayla Proctor tomorrow. She's our obviously our teacher who does graphic design. If we're doing the piece with uh, uh, a mailing, I need a graphic design person to help us with it. When we were doing referendum projects, it was great to tie into EUA and Findor. This isn't a referendum project. So it's trying to say, okay, how can I utilize some, some of her time to help me with that? There's things that Herb and I've talked about with the website. Can we have some help with that? There's some people that we could probably just do at a, at a much lower cost, having them help us with those pieces. The social media pieces I talked about with the, the Andrea Gribble and the social media for, for EDU. Those are some ways we can move things forward. They're not with a specific concerned person, but they start to at least address some of the options we have. I've seen districts who started with working with Andrea on, this, on the social media piece, and then as they progress to a different level, they progress out of it or they keep it. So it, it, it's, when I look at the communications piece, it is one of my priorities because I think it's an area that we continually need to do a better job of how we tell our story and how we can message all these pieces. We look at the linkage meetings. Right now, that's planned by us. That's something that we can bring up the concepts of how we're doing it. The communications person is actually formatting those. I mean, that's what Julie, you and I uh -huh, saw uh -huh. from some of the other models, was uh -huh. they're very involved with that community engagement piece. Uh -huh. They're helping to lead that. So it's not just dropping pictures on social media. It's helping to really help with the whole engagement piece. But I think in order to really determine what our needs are, we have to go through that audit process first, which is intensive. And I think that's what the committee was responding to, saying, do we want to be working with having multiple focus groups right now and we have some other things that maybe we need to do community engagement around as well or first. Or other priorities. So, other so I guess I would assure you the communication piece will still be on our radar. It'll still continue to move forward. I think that the direction from the committee was this the full-blown audit in the way that it was presented not being the direction we go right now. We're down to consent agenda. So we could take all of them. Move 
to approve the consent agenda. Second. 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 Discussion. I'd like to uh, obviously, uh, you know, the, this is going to pass. Uh, but when I look at all of these trips, you know, we're we're doing the same thing that we did in athletics. You know, we're bringing college college down to uh, high school, uh, and you know, we're doing the same thing in trips and travel. You know, China. You know, is maybe a safe place, but uh, there's a lot of things you can pick up in China. You know, from a health standpoint. But I'll make a statement to that. We do need to watch where, if we're going to be the ones that designate our name on something, is there a liability to that? We do need to watch where where some of these trips go. And I'll also make a statement about. I don't know why we limit athletics if we don't limit anything else. Granted, they go more, but we did make a policy change years back. Um, the only one I think it affected was softball, that they went to Florida, but they paid for their own trip. They did everything like everything else. Interesting that we did limit athletics and we don't limit anything else from a band thing to a this to a that or to a whatever. And they're raising their own money and it, it, again, I, I get it. but. These are off school time. They're not connected to or a requirement of a particular participation in one of our activities. So you don't have to go. I mean, my understanding with the whole athletic piece of it was it was implied that you had to go. And that did impact individuals' perception of. What consequences would be meted out if you chose not to go? And could you really choose not to go? It was assumed you would. That's the difference, Gary. I, 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 do, I do question the number of trips who we seem to be opening up, up that far abroad. It, it has definitely grown and mushroomed. And it is different because parents and students are making those decisions on their own, but still, but we just We're said, planning and coordinating a lot of we, abroad trips now. We just sat through a social justice where uh, a kid didn't want to participate because uh, he couldn't afford going uh, to uh, Culver's, you know, in some of our programs, you know, and he felt left, left out. You know, if you're, you know, I would assume that if you're uh, going on the China trip, you're, in, you're taking Mandarin. You know, if you're going to uh, orchestra, you're, you're taking orchestra, you know, and, you know, this here is probably very similar. Do, does that kid feel left out because he can't afford to go? Sure. You know, well, so I will say the China trip was planned two years ago and not enough wanted to go, so they can't take the trip. No, I, so I, it I did read, happen. I, I right. And so we're trying it again. I, I mean, not everybody goes on the orchestra trip. When we say there's all of these trips, if you'll notice, they're in very different groups. You know, you don't have one kid going on three trips um, based on how they're laid out. Again, visually, so you, you do see them twice. They come here as a pre-approval for planning, yep. and then they come back as final approval. So you see them twice come through. And O'Brien and I have sat down and kind of looked at what's the cycle of the trips. <coughs> so we try to keep those within a consistent cycle for the students coming through the high school. I'm just wondering when the math trip is going to be. <laughs> well, it sure, depends on when the math team it. has a tournament. Mm -hmm. that You'd go on the one, right? There you go. Of course. All right. Um, good discussion. Uh, any other discussion? There's a retirement that, well, we have to approve. <laughs> we have a retirement on, the, on our consent agenda, so just wanted to bring that to our attention. That's why Joan was mad at you before. So. Yeah. It makes us mad. I think we should, we could pull her off the consent agenda. <laughs> Separate discussion. <laughs> and then. Yes. 
Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on. Uh, board business. I don't have anything there tonight. But I, I would like to mention that um, Senator Erpenbach is having a listening session mm -hmm. at the community center on Saturday, February 24th from 9 to 10 at 1. So, um, before we go to future agendas, I have a little award for Jeff from the Wisconsin School Board Association, a level one pin. Wow. Awesome. Ooh. Go you. Go Jack. What was that? Yeah. <laughs> Level, Level one camera from School Board Association. Professional or professional development stuff. There you go. Okay. Meetings. All right. What Meetings. do you need? All right. We're looking at see if we can do budget and HR back to back if possible. I'm going to throw out either March 5th or March 8th. So March Fifth does not work for me. Okay. What about the eighth? <coughs> what, is, what day is that? Thursday. We doing a morning meeting? That would be preferable. Yeah. Yes. I think March eighth. March eighth would work. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Can budget go first? Sure. What's that? Six thirty. <laughs> yeah, what time would you like budget to go? 8 o'clock. Does that work? Or Steve, how much time? You want it. Yeah, it can be earlier if you want it. Yeah. You want it like 7.30? Whatever works mm -hmm. for you. you. We can do it at 7.30. Does that work? It, it doesn't matter. You can do 7.30? How would it be respectful? How long do you need, Steve? Um, an hour, oh. to an hour and a half, depending on... So who's also on HR? I am. I think. Do you, what's your plans for that day? Well, nothing now. <laughs> Going to budget. <laughs> so she just can't so We can either do 8:30 or 8:45 or 9. And who else is on HR? HR is Joan, Julie, Peggy. Does it work for both of you? Sure. 8:45 or 9. Yeah, well, we just do that. Okay. So we'll do budget at 7:30. We'll do HR at. 8:45. Great. On March 8th. Yes. On March 8th. March 8th. March 8th. Yeah. So all that will mean is we have a board meeting that on the 12th, so that the, the packet will actually have what we have in the committee packet will be in the board packet. Um, we also need a facilities meeting. Let's see if we could do that. Steve, when do you end of February? Or do you want to go into March? Doesn't matter. Did the baseball folks give you a date in the They did not. So I would stuff? prefer probably <clears throat> what about that first week in March again just to give them time. So facilities, Dave, Gary, and Joan. Do you have a date in the week of the fifth? That might work. Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. I can do any of them. How about how about Monday? The fifth? Is there a time that works well, Leah? 4.30. 4.30 work for everybody? Monday, March 5th, 4.30. Perfect. 4.30 and about an hour? Yes. Um, policy I'll schedule at the next meeting. Anything else we need from, from committees right now? Scheduled insurance and okay. Will we be scheduling another meeting? Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you all. I do have one quick question. How do you want to handle it? You didn't have a chance, and I don't want to you know, have a discussion on the potential draft or letter that we wanted to have on the truth. Um, no need to even hand it out. I don't think we're going to have time to go and talk about it. But how do we want to do? handle that <coughs> because um, basically what we wanted to do is have um, well, our plan is to have four letters each year possibly for publication in the tribune. Um, <coughs> I've been giving this a lot of thought in terms of uh, 
the feedback that I've been receiving in terms of wanting to get people engaged and you know, in, inform it and also get them involved in the process. There's a lot of different ways that you can approach writing such a letter. Um, and in my conversations with um, the Tribune and Roberta Bauman in particular, she's giving me kind of a length uh, idea. One question is whether we want to be giving it a title, or what to call it a title, like from an administrator's desk comes from Randy, and there's some oh. uh, options, like what do we want to be saying from the board. So oh. my question is, um, I, I'm, the draft is a very, very rough draft. I wouldn't want them to see that now unless we really have time. For Why don't we do this, Peggy? Maybe Joan and I can look at the rough draft give you some feedback, and then after that, we can send it to the whole board? Well, yeah, I don't even have no. some of the content ready yet. All right. All uh, right. But maybe we can chat a little. I mean, part of it sure. is I wanted to design it in a way that's not just informative, but provides links to other areas, so that, ah. um, which is very right. different. I've written articles for publications that behave that way, and is that what we want to be doing with, say, something like this, so that if you have it on site, then if, if that feels like it's helpful, then I will finish writing the content give it to you, and then we can provide the kind of feed you can put on what you think that's meaning in our chapters. Okay. Can we the uh, email or something? Fair enough. Yes, and Great. don't. Um, I do need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Have you ever heard anything about pants at a baseball field? I think it's interesting. I want to leave people in the room.